Sister Natalia. Matt good? Brad, yeah. Lovely to have you here. It's good to see you again. Yeah. In person. Do, do I look different? You look different because the last time I saw you, you were two-dimensional. I know we've met once before. Um, I definitely thought you were going to say something about my weight or something and nope. I was like, you don't do that Never. with women, Matt. <laughs> Never. Um, you do look different. You lost the beard, much to my dismay. Do you want to tell people what you said? <laughs> um, I don't remember. You, uh, it probably was lacking charity though. Yeah. So I don't know if I should <laughs> yeah. say it. <laughs> um, I don't care if you say it. Well, you said, man. You stopped going to a Byzantine church and you shaved your beard. You've become a real pansy. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, but you gave me permission. I don't remember that I said that, yeah. So it's okay. Oh, there we go. Now everyone First knows. time I met you, I was giving a talk in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. I think it was Cleveland, the seminary. Mm -hmm. And immediately after I was walking out and there was this woman who looked like a Muslim, you, and you were skipping through the snowbanks. <laughs> I, I was just like, this woman's amazing. Yeah, it was yeah. great. But um, we already had the mutual connection of Father Michael. Yeah. So I knew of you, though I had never met you. So. Sweet. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for making the drive down. Yeah, it's really great. I have uh, one of the other nuns, Mother Gabriella, with me. So What's shout out to Mother Gabriella over in the corner. Tying chotki. So. Tying chotkis. Yeah. What is a chotki for those at home? Um, chotki is a prayer rope that we pray the Jesus prayer on. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or some variation of that. And how often so. are you tying them? Is this just something you do when... Um, am I allowed to say what you're tying that one for? No. Oh, I don't mean okay. what you're tying it for. Um, I mean, like, it's cool that she's sitting in the corner doing it. Like, do you do this in the car? Do you do it just... Yeah, yeah. Oftentimes in the time. car or... Because you sell them, right? When we're... Um, oh, man. We do, technically. That's I don't good. know if you I should. want thousands of people to know that, though. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> we, they do not sell them. Do we, not buy them. They are horribly... They're, they're the worst chocolate. You do not want this. Ever. That is so, yeah, sometimes people will be on the show and they'll be like, yeah, my email is, I'm like, oh gosh, don't do that. Don't Why do that. would you do that? No, yeah. <sighs> but yeah, it's, it's nice to have you. Um, yeah. You just got off a Pustinia. I did, yeah. Tell us. Did I tell you that? You did, yeah. Oh, yeah. I did, yes. Or no, and it came to me in prayer. <laughs> tell me. <laughs> yeah, did, I told you. <laughs> tell, tell us what that is and why you took it and what was that like? Sure. So Pustinia is the Slavic word for desert um, and... It um it kind of became popularized, I would say it became popularized in the United States through Catherine Doherty, mm -hmm. um, a lay mystic who's just an incredible woman. But she um she started the uh, Madonna House. Yeah. Um, and up in Cumbermere, Ontario, I believe. Sure. Yeah. You know things. Um the so so Pustinia meaning desert is is the time that we take to to be alone with the Lord in the desert. Mm -hmm. um, because the desert isn't meant to be a place. Um, I gave a whole talk on this about, it was called um, Finding Hope in the Desert, I think. But it's, it's you know, people think that to go out into solitude, into the desert, can be a place of um, emptiness. But it's actually a place of encounter with the Lord. Like, that's where he went um, for when he, when, you know, fasted for 40 days. And, um and that's where we can encounter him. And there's like, there's the verse in Hosea, I want to say it's Hosea 2, yeah. but it says, um, I will, it's the Lord speaking. And he says, I will allure her. I will draw her into the desert. Right. Um, and there I will speak tenderly to her heart. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah. So anyways, it's it's a time of, of being alone with the Lord, basically. So at our monastery, we kind of use the word to be both the time away and the place. So we have we have these little retreat houses called Pustinia. Mm -hmm. Um and us, us nuns, we go once a month, we go on Pustinia, each of us, for about 48 hours. I would like so. there to exist a religious order whose sole job is to look after families' kids while they do this as parents. Yeah. That would be nice. That would be nice. If someone feels called to start that order. We, we, do have, um, we do have some couples. So we have one that I call it the, I won't say their name because I don't know if they would want that, but I, I use their last name and call it the, we'll say Johnson. I call it the Johnson trade-off. Um, <laughs> and what they do, they live a couple hours away from the monastery, <clears> but... <throat> One of them will come on Pustinia for 24 hours, and then the other one drives up to the monastery with all of the kids. The couple and the kids all stay and have dinner with us. Yeah. And then the one who was on Pustinia takes the kids home, and the other one gets a 24-hour Pustinia. That's really beautiful. And so, um, so that's pretty cool. So you stayed in one of the cabins. Mm -hmm. How many hours did you say? Um, it's typically about it's typically about 48. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And what's that experience like? Because, I mean, you're in a monastery. You're already praying a great deal. Presumably, you don't have as much of the distractions that 
I do and other people do in the <laughs> you world. You think, yeah. Yeah, but no. <laughs> um, no, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it's it's less than in the world. Um, it doesn't feel like that at times. Mm. But there's, you know, it's 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 different to it's different to take the intentional time, you know, um, because there's a difference between there's a difference between first of all being alone and being in solitude. Um, I don't I don't feel alone when I'm on Pustinia. So, um, but there's also a difference between an interior and an exterior silence. And so, though though the two obviously complement one another greatly. And so there's something about like being very intentional with this time of both interior and exterior silence mm-hmm. and being in solitude. Um, mm-hmm. that allows for, for a different kind of encounter with the Lord than we have in our, our day-to-day life. Um, but it's also like, I'm not, I'm not doing, I'm stepping away from the work of the monastery. And so it's just a lot more time of intentional, um, intentional prayer. We're supposed to try to pray without ceasing, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, as St. Paul says, but, but it's time to do that more intentionally. And maybe if you have like something that you want to spend a big chunk of time in prayer about, then we have this, this chunk of time. Mm. So. So what I was going to ask is, what's it like going from everyday life into the Pustinia? Like, what's I'm sure there's like a slowing down period where. <laughs> um, you mean like once I get into the Pustinia, there's a slowing down period. I, I'm just thinking of my eight day silent retreat last uh-huh. year, right? Like you show up and they like, here's the chapel, here's your bedroom, the end. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well now, now what do I do? Yeah. And it takes a while to kind of fall into a more human tempo. Yeah, I think I think it's not it's not it's probably not as I guess that's the difference maybe of having um, having like you're saying more distractions in the world. I don't feel that transition as much um, as a nun. I don't think mm-hmm. there's there might be a little bit of time that I need to kind of slow my brain down or whatever. Um, but but we have enough times of you know we have a few hours a day that are designated as silence and. Every Friday morning we have silence. Uh, we have a Pustanya morning until noon, and so there's silence, and we don't even have we don't even have morning prayers of community and things like that. And so I think I have enough enough times of silence each day that there's not too too it's much a, of a transition, it's a drastic transition. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you do have to slow your slow your brain down a little bit. We have um, so the the Jesus prayer, like I was talking about, that we pray on the Chotki uh, each day at morning prayer and evening prayer at the monastery. We start with 15 minutes of the Jesus prayer in silence. And and that's part of the intention, especially Vespers, um, evening prayer, also called the Spurs by some people. Um, <laughs> Me, because of my that. dumb phone texting you incorrectly. <laughs> yes. Um, so the, it, like, you've been going all day. And, you know, even as monastics, we can, we can just get caught up in all of the things that we're doing during the day, all of the work. And so the, the, Jesus prayer at the beginning of Vespers, those 15 minutes are really a great time to just kind of calm, calm the mind and really try to, to enter into um, like these deep, deeper places within yourself um, to, to approach Vespers with more of that interior silence. So, um, yeah, so we do need the spaces to kind of have the transition too. I want to talk more about the Jesus prayer. We touched upon it, what Chalky means and all that. But it'd be cool for those who are watching right now and they're like, I've really never heard of this. I'd maybe love to be in, get into it. Or, mm-hmm. t- tell us a bit more about it. Okay. Um, the So the Chalky, it kind of looks like, um, you know, a lot of people think that uh, it's a rosary that we have on our belt. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is, so that's, that's a chotki that I wear on my belt. That is not one that we made. That's one that a friend of mine gave me from Ukraine. Hmm. Um, well done for not saying the Ukraine. Continue. <laughs> Thank you. One of our sisters is Ukrainian. So, okay. um, the, you can just toss it across sorry, the table. Sorry, it's sorry, like it's not a secret. Good. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, some of them have a, some of them have a tassel on them. So, uh, we don't make them with tassels. So if you want a tassel, do not order one from Christ the Bride of Monastery. And if you don't want one, still don't order from us <laughs> because we can't handle the amount of, um, but the, the tassel is, is meant to dry your tears. Um, so as you're praying the Jesus prayer, uh, there's, it's, a, it's supposed to move your heart, um, w- with contrition, but also simply with, with love for the Lord. So, so like I said, the, the prayer um, the, the form that I use, cause it, it could have more or less words than this is Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And so it's this beautiful, it's, it's acknowledging, um, it's acknowledging the identity of Jesus. It's acknowledging his, his divinity, um, son of God. 
and and it's acknowledging his his mercy and it's acknowledging our sinfulness and so it's got all of that in it um so it's a really powerful prayer it's got the name of jesus mm. so it's a very powerful prayer and the the way i typically pray it um some of the fathers write about praying the jesus prayer with your breathing mm -hmm. and that's something that that really they and I recommend you do under the direction of someone. So with a spiritual director, I wouldn't re recommend necessarily just like picking it up and trying it on your own. But um, and you got to say why now, because that sounds a bit well confusing to people. What do you mean I can't do a prayer on my own? Yeah. So um, it can be it can be a very intense prayer. And it's one if you're if you're trying to especially if you're trying to like tie it in with your breathing, then it, you could just start getting like even unhealthy breathing habits and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, but part of the intention of praying it with your breathing is to um, because breathing is something that we just do all the time, mm -hmm. you know, without without thinking about it, obviously. And so if you if you get in the habit of praying the Jesus prayer with your breathing, then you're going to start praying the Jesus prayer throughout the day. Um, and this this really does happen. Like I realize yeah. that there are times that I'm praying the Jesus prayer without even realizing it. I, yeah. I, I can attest to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, My wife had surgery a couple of years back and when she woke up and was still unconscious, she was praying the Jesus prayer out loud. That's and beautiful. And her doctors told her about that. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so so anyways, the when I pray it with my breathing, I typically... Um, for for each of the two phrases, mm -hmm. I breathe in for the first half and out for the second half. So I'll yeah. breathe in, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ breathe God. out, Son of God. Oh, okay. And then the second yeah. part, um, I particularly like praying it that way because then for the second part, I'm breathing in, have mercy on me, and breathing out, a sinner. I like that and, you do that because it really slows the prayer down. Yeah. So it takes me, so to, to pray 100 knots of the Jesus prayer, it takes me about 15 minutes typically. Um, and I know this because we have the 15 minutes before matins and vespers yeah, and, yeah. and I typically get around the tchotchke one time. Yeah. Um, so, so anyways, I like that because in the second half, I'm, it's, I'm very intentionally breathing in his mercy and breathing out my sinfulness. And, and the second aspect of that is the order of it is I'm breathing in his mercy before I'm breathing out his sinfulness. Because I think that we have this temptation to to try mm. to to try to kind of like perfect ourselves and get rid of our sin in order to approach God, in order to ask him for mercy, in order to ask him for forgiveness. It's like, um, I've fixed myself. Now forgive me for those things I did. But actually we need his mercy to even be moved to work on the sin. You know, like we need his mercy in order to expel the sinfulness. And so I really like the, That's the order beautiful. of that. That's beautiful. Yeah, we love him because he loved us first. Exactly, yeah. So it gets rid of that kind of self-reliance. Um, it doesn't get rid of the self-reliance. I'm extremely self-reliant. Okay. It, it works on the self-reliance. Ah, um, yeah, so. Do you ever get kind of bored with the formula and try and come up with ones on your own? Um, I don't get bored with it. I will say there's something that I learned from a Coptic nun that's been really beautiful for me, and that's incorporating, incorporating scripture into the Jesus prayer at times. And so... Um, most especially I'll do this with the Psalms. So, so for instance, one of the Psalms, it says something about um, my soul waits for you in silence. Mm -hmm. And so I might pray, that's, that's one of my favorite forms of the Jesus prayer incorporating scripture is Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, my soul waits for you in silence. Um, yeah. So I might, I might do something like that, uh, that kind of combination. But I think really as much as we can, sticking to that original form is good because it, it again, it has it has the name of Jesus, it has the recognition of His divinity, His mercy, our sinfulness. It's got like everything in there. You yeah, know? So. yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. So. Hmm. This espresso is really delicious. Is it good? Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I, I like the it. cups too. Yeah. Someone brought these. Shout out to Mike Welker and uh, Cindy Welker who brought me four cups for my birthday. Ah, when was your you, birthday? You gave me nothing. The, well, I don't know when your birthday is. It was July 16th. Oh, you've never given me anything for my birthday. When's your birthday? Mm, does it matter? Nope, because I was still You're there. not even a good friend. You don't <laughs> even know my birthday. When is it? April 12th. Okay. Is it a feast day? Of course it's a feast day. Somewhere. Oh, In yeah. one of the calendars, it's yeah. a feast day. It was Pascha last year. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, 2020. Why do you look like a Muslim woman? That's a good question. It's more so that the Muslims look like us. <laughs> so, um, so, so this was the the traditional Eastern habit um, before it was the traditional Muslim wear. Mm -hmm. um, so you could have to ask them. Yeah. Why do you look like Sister Natalia? Yeah. Who is Sister? I'm Natalia? sure they'd love to hear that question. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind of comments do you get? 
you know, I I don't think I don't think as many people mistake us for Muslim as you would think. Mm-hmm. Um, I think part of that is because of the chotki um, on our belt. People think it's a rosary, mm. um, and so they the rosary is not an Eastern tradition. So mm-hmm. as as you know, Matt, mm-hmm. um, so it's not a rosary, but. The but we do have lots and lots of other devotions to the Theotokos, before our lady. Everybody is so, shaming you in the yeah, comments section. Before before all of the comments about how Sister Natalia hates Mary, please know we do love Mary very much, and we in fact pray to her more in our. Than you do. So no. shut up. Oh, that feels a bit. Um, that's not what I was going to say. That was your. Those were from your mouth, mm-hmm. not mine. Um, but are you looking for the shaming comments? Yeah, the, there's none of that thing yet. Wow. They'll come though, don't worry. That's why you, YouTube so, comment boxes exist. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so so anyways, the I don't think we we don't get it as often as you would think. But, but still, at the you same time, I'm sure there are lots of people who think it and simply don't say anything. Um, well, I the, suppose, but, but see, even if it doesn't look like a Muslim dress, it, right. it doesn't look like a stereotypical nun dress. Right. So what kind mm-hmm. of things do people say when you get so chit-chatting? So sometimes, sometimes the comment um, when people come up to us, they say, what are you? <laughs> and I'm like, a human being? What are you? <laughs> what are you, a rude human being? <laughs> um, so, so no, we get that a lot. What are you? Um, and we also get sometimes the, are you, um, <laughs> what is the... Do you, and then we usually just say, I'm a nun. And um, sometimes I'll say I'm a Catholic nun just to, to kind of clarify. But mm-hmm. the best um, the best response I had, that, that barista that I was telling you about earlier yeah. um, in, in Whole Foods, um, she, was, she was very enchanted by the habit. Um, and anyways, she said um, once she realized I was a nun, she was like, she was like, that's punk. And I was like, <laughs> all right, great. And, that's um, what it takes to be punk in a day yeah. and age where everybody's rebelling against all yeah. norms and yeah. customs. And she said something about, she was like, yeah, I knew an Orthodox priest one time and he also wore the black drab. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, black drab, that's what I wear. Yeah. So, yeah. But we do get, we get a surprising number of people who, um, who instantly recognize that we're nuns. Um, and they, they might, they might ask for, for clarification, but their assumption is that we're a nun. Yeah. And, and that can be just really, really, it, we, we get very few negative reactions once they know that we're nuns. Uh, I think that probably happens a lot more with priests than it does with nuns, mm. but, um, it's overwhelmingly positive, but it's, it's part of the reason that I, that I love that we wear the habit is because I'll have people come up to me in the grocery store or the doctor's office or because we, we always wear this, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and even on my home visit when I'm with my parents and stuff, I'm wearing the habit. And so we'll, we'll just get people come up to us in these random places and they say, are you a nun? And, and I'll say yes. And then they just pour out their heart and, and just like the depths of their heart. And, um, and sometimes they'll share like places of shame or just these places they need prayer or they, and, and it's, it's so humbling because. I know it's immediately clear that this isn't this isn't about me, right? Like they have no idea who I am, mm-hmm. but to them, like I'm 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 a bride of Christ, and so they're speaking to me as a bride of Christ, as someone who has, as far as they know, an intimate relationship with the Lord, and and they're they're entrusting their heart to me, and that's very humbling because again, I know it has nothing to do with me. They don't know they don't mm. know me from from Adam, um, from Eve, uh, and so. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's a really beautiful thing. Mm. Did you tell me you grew up in Colorado? I, I'm most recently from Colorado. I've moved over 20 times, but wow. most recently I'm from wow. Colorado. Yeah. Why? Uh, my dad was in the Navy cool. for 20 years. My dad was in the so. Navy too. Oh, Respect. Yeah. Um, what is it like for your parents? The first time you came back mm-hmm. dressed like that, did, did, were they proud of that? Did they think it was a bit weird? How did your friends and acquaintances yeah. react? Um, yeah, those are very, those are different questions. Um, the, my parents, my parents are, are thrilled. They're, uh, I mean, they're just super supportive, really, really beautiful people. Um, my dad's my biggest fan. Um, but he, uh, they, so, so they're both really happy with it. Um, they, I'm sure it was hard. I think, I think it wasn't, I don't think it was a big transition for them, for me wearing the habit. Um, I, I'm sure it was hard for my mom, um, that I had a new name Mm. simply because like, she's the one who named me. This is the name that she gave me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm sure that was a little difficult. Uh, but they, yeah, they're, they're just thrilled and they've, it's never been, it's never been weird for them or a question for them of like, 
um, well, why, like, why can't you wear your normal clothes when you're at home or anything like that? Like, they just are super respectful of it. And, um, yeah, so that's been easy. And with, uh, um, like, do you bump into people from school or that used to work with and like, oh, wow, you look very different to me. Yeah. It's pretty shocking for people who knew me when I was in college. Mm -hmm. Um, no, it's, it's happened. Um, it's happened a couple times. Um, but, but not often. I think that, um, for the most part, the people that I see now are the people who knew me when I was discerning. So it wasn't yeah, really, yeah. wasn't totally shocking. So yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then I'm sorry, I have a thousand questions about your habit, but. Why is Mother Gabriella wearing a gray thing? It's a great a question. She probably should have been wearing black. So, um, <laughs> shame. <laughs> shame. We are it all about shame anything. in our community. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't get that vibe at all. So no, we so so black is the the traditional the traditional habit is what we would um so theoretically we would maybe always be wearing black, but we have the the gray habits are for. Um, especially for work, hmm. um, especially if we're like working outside and it's very hot or we're working with bleach or things like that. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so we do have the gray habits that we can wear. Those are more for like work and play and, and the black is for, so I guess she thought we were just going to be playing a lot when yeah, we came I was gonna ask, How do women um, play in the monastery? So, what do you get up to? Oh, we have lots of play. We'll go, we'll go kayaking. Mother Gabriella went paddle boarding recently. So that's really, fun. um, but we'll go kayaking, Wearing we'll go that hiking. Habit. Um, no. <laughs> well, we'll go, we'll go hiking. We also have an exercise habit that we can wear. Ah. Um, so does it look like sweatpants and a sweater? What does your exercise um, habit look like? How is that different? It's culottes. Do you know what culottes are? No. Yeah, no. That's, that's your, what is it? um, it's the, it was big in like what time frame, Mother Gabriella? What, what time frame was, yeah, probably like fifties. Hmm. Um, but it's like the, the pants that go like maybe mid calf, but there's like so much material that they kind of look like skirts. Oh, okay. You know what I'm talking about? Not at all, but like super flowy and yep. anyways, um, that and just like an exercise shirt and then a head covering. But sweet. Yeah. Um, so paddle boarding, kayaking. Yeah. Um, hiking. I'm so glad you didn't say like hopscotch and checkers. Oh, you know, no, no, please. Um, I, we do like games though. Yeah. Yeah. Board games. Mm -hmm. Like cool board games or old lame ones that have been donated to you. Um, both. Yeah. Yeah. I, one, of, cool one of my, one of my favorites is Ticket to Ride. Have you played Ticket yes, to Ride? Yes, it's a great game. That one's so fun. Um, a friend of mine recently spent, uh, sent us, uh, what's it called? What's it called? I think Spot It. Okay. Uh, and that one's really fun too, but yeah, no, we, we like games too, but, um, I like climbing trees. I like. Do you have particular trees or just any tree you'll climb? Uh, any You're going to love my son, breathe. Peter. Remember Peter? I Peter can fly. Oh, he Is can he gonna fly. Can he still fly? Can he show me? He will show you that. Yes. He'll also show you our bees. Oh, that's which fun. Which he loves. Will he climb a tree with me? Yes, 100%. Great. That's that, he'll be so excited. Yeah. Um, I don't know what else we do for for fun, for play. But... You know, I'm. people ask me like what I do for fun and downtime. I'm, I don't feel boring. Like I have a joyful life. But my my fun is sitting with people and talking. Hmm. It's, it's this um, smoking a cigar yeah. while I'm sitting talking, having a drink of bourbon while, while I'm sitting, sitting and talking. talking. Yeah, yeah. That's about it, really, mm -hmm. just sitting and talking. I also like to read. We're all all of us at the monastery. Well, most of us at the monastery are pretty big readers. Which which I had watched your interview with Father Boniface. Um, yeah. Because I love Father Boniface. He's a good friend. He's so great. And he just like he looks at you and his eyes just and you're like stop it, into stop your soul. it. He just sees I never gave everything. you permission. I know it's. Um, but like it. with such love, yeah, such love, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. But, uh, anyways, I watched your interview with him and when you asked him like what he reads for fun, um, what did he say? It was like theology books and like oh. textbooks. And what do you like read that. for fun? Oh, I like Elizabeth Gouge. Have you I don't know who Elizabeth is, Gouge. Um, I, uh, Jane Eyre is one of my favorite mm -hmm. books. I really like Jane Eyre. Um, Michael O'Brien. You like him, yeah. Yeah. He's great. Um, so I don't know. Mm. I'm currently reading, um, Amongst other things, uh, Winnie the Pooh. Really? Good. Yes. So I'm reading Winnie the Pooh in Spanish to brush up on my Spanish. Really? Good uh -huh. for you. So that's really fun. Um, yeah. So. I'm reading the Brothers Karamazov again. Mm, that's like so good. Third time. So good. But I'm going through it very slowly. You know how the chapters are quite mm -hmm. short because they were written for a Russian newspaper originally, actually. So I'll, I'll like read one a morning. Just, he is There's the so much in there. Yeah. I did, yeah. I did a book club on that with a with a couple well now they're both priests at the time it was a priest and they're brothers though so we um it was my my friend's uh 
Father Zach, maybe, and now Father Drew, maybe. And so mm. we called the book club um, the Brothers, maybe. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're biological brothers. It makes me miss my time in Eastern Christianity, my stint in the Byzantine church. It really does make me miss it. We will always welcome you back, Thank Matt. you so much. It's yeah. very kind of you. But we might put you through some acts of penance first. Yes. What would that look like? I don't Just kidding. Know. No shaming comments, please. <laughs> We're Catholic too, and we, yeah, all you, that. You said, by the way, Father Boniface, I said this to him, he has the greatest habit the, the, in, in the West, at least, like that black habit is beautiful. Mm. And it must be so much more convenient than the Dominican habit. Oh, Trying to seriously. eat pasta, look what happens. Seriously. So and I spill everything. Do you? Yeah. I can't believe it. I didn't Actually, I didn't spill any of that espresso. Well, that's espresso. You said yeah. only black drinks, remember? So that's what we gave you. That's true. <laughs> so you said you liked the interview with Father Boniface? I did, yeah. Actually, there was something that you said in it that I wanted to comment on. Um, because you reminded me of... Um, you were talking about, you were talking about something, something about how, when, um, your marriage mm -hmm. helps you to recognize your own failings and your own sin. Um, and that like, it's revelatory for you. Whereas if you, if you weren't married, you might not see those same things. Yes. Um, as opposed to like it being able to hide things. And it reminded me of one of my, one of my favorite parts. You know what? I should have marked this before If I can started. remind you of the Philokalia, I'm doing well. That's great. You, you did. Yeah. So good job. Um, you reminded me of the Philokalia. Um, something that, that I think it's Cashin. It's either Cashin or Evagrius. Um, it's totally Cashin. So he's writing on the eight vices mm. and um and he's i'll tell a joke while you look yeah, please it. that's what i was gonna so, say so i don't actually have any jokes i told them all with peter Craig. it's fine i found it okay good um so he's talking about the eight vices so for some of your listeners might not be familiar with this but um and if you hear you hear in the west about the seven deadly sins mm -hmm. so actually where this originated correct me if i'm if you know that i'm wrong on this or whatever but um, is that uh, one of the Eastern fathers, one of the desert fathers, Evagrius, Evagrius, the solitary Evagrius Ponticus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wrote Talking Back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, book. the Antoreticos. Yeah, mm. we read that for, I think everyone at the monastery read that for the Great Fast this mm. last year for Lent. Um, wow, through the whole thing. Talking mm -hmm. Back, you read that? Mm -hmm. Wow, cool. So, Sometimes it feels like a bit of a stretch, doesn't it? Like he's oh, trying to come yeah. up with more content. I was, I was talking about that. I was talking bit. about that the other, oh, really? the other day. Yeah. I was talking to people. I was like when he, some of this scripture. So, so the, the yeah. whole concept of the watching, talking back, yeah. right. The whole concept of it is, is Evagrius. Um, he takes certain temptations or the certain thoughts that we'll mm -hmm. hear, um, from, from either the devil or from ourselves or from God. But typically he's talking about ones that we hear from the devil and, um, and he t uses scripture verses to talk back to those things. So to refute them mm -hmm. or on the rare occasion that it's a thought from God uh, to, to, to give praise for that, to give thanks for that. Um, so, uh, yeah, but some of them, I'm just like, I, that is absolute. I can't imagine that's what that scripture meant. Um, yeah. But so they're, they're a bit of a stretch. I think honestly, though, if people want to read that book, I think what was most helpful for me in it was simply the way that he articulates the thoughts yeah. i'm like i do yes. have that thought and temptation Makes you feel less alone. and i never would have been able to articulate sort of like it as comedian. well as he You're did like, that's exactly what i feel <laughs> not exactly like that so, but it's true yeah, yeah i'm so like, i i bet you are the first person to ever compare a virus the solitary <laughs> to seinfeld to a stand-up comedian yeah yeah um, no but it's so spot yeah. on he's like when when the spirit of sloth says mm -hmm. whatever you can watch another episode of Netflix. What's the harm? Right. That's a direct quote. Direct quote from yeah. the Bagrius. Yeah. yeah. But but it's great because it's helpful for confession or for spiritual direction yeah. to be able to say this is what I was experiencing. Like this was so. Anyways, Evagrius, the man who wrote this book, um, he came up with uh, the concept of the eight evil thoughts. The eight evil thoughts. Then um, Cassian, who was a disciple of Evagrius, he took the eight evil thoughts combined two of them, combined another two, added one, that's the seven deadly sins. And then he brought that West and then Gregory the Great kind of yes. like, yeah. Interesting. So, but Cashin learned the, of the eight evil thoughts from Evagrius since he was his disciple. So he's writing on the eight evil thoughts. And on, this is an excerpt from his writing on anger. So uh, bear with me. It's kind of a long paragraph, Please, but no. it's really good. Let's do it. And um, this is what you reminded me 
of when you were saying that that um, your marriage has been revelatory for you mm-hmm. as opposed to to kind of hiding your sin. It's helped you to see it. Mm-hmm. He says, self-reform and peace are not achieved through the patience which others show us, but through our own long suffering toward our neighbor. When we try to escape the struggle for long suffering by retreating into solitude, those unhealed passions we take there with us are merely hidden, not erased. For unless our passions are first purged, solitude and withdrawal from the world not only foster them, but also keep them concealed, Mm -hmm. no longer allowing us to perceive what passion it is that enslaves us. On the contrary, they impose on us an illusion of virtue and persuade us to believe that we have achieved long-suffering and humility because there is no one present to provoke us and test us. But as soon as something happens which does arouse and challenge us, our hidden and previously unnoticed passions immediately break out like uncontrolled horses that have long been kept unexercised and idle, dragging their driver all the more violently and wildly to destruction. He then he then um, oh, goes on for a while. Going, um, going. Let's read the whole thing. Okay. Audio book. Okay. Philip yeah. number one. Um, no, seriously. Okay. I really want you to keep okay. Reading. Our passions grow fiercer when left idle through lack of contact with other people. Even that shadow of patience and long suffering, which we thought we possessed while we mixed with our <laughs> brethren, is lost in our isolation through not being exercised. Poisonous creatures that live quietly in their lairs in the desert display their fury only when they detect someone approaching. And likewise, passion-filled men who live quietly not because of their virtuous disposition, but because of their solitude, spit forth their venom whenever someone approaches and provokes them. This is why those seeking perfect gentleness must make every effort to avoid anger not only towards men, but also towards animals and even inanimate objects. Oh, that's excellent. Keep, he then, keep he, going, please. Oh. Honestly, I mean, okay. we can pause and comment okay. on it. But um, I mean, immediately thought of people who throw the remote control on things like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Like you give, yeah, it's almost like this is an acceptable way of lashing out. But then when you're with people, you lash out in an analogous way. Right, right, right. He says, um, he says, okay, yeah, there's just one more short paragraph. I can remember how when I lived in the desert, I became angry when the rushes, became angry with the rushes, sorry, because they were either too thick or too thin. <laughs> <laughs> or with a piece of wood when I wished to cut it quickly and could not. Or with a flint when I was in a hurry to light a fire and the spark would not come. So all-embracing was my anger that it was aroused even against inanimate objects. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. One thing I notice about the saints of the East, and I'm sure this is true of Western saints, I just notice it more in the East, is how they talk about their own failures mm-hmm. very openly. Mm-hmm. Even current ones. Not just things I've overcome and now I'm great, but... But, but it's interesting because they, they talk about, what I'm struck by is they talk about it not with a spirit of despair. You yeah. know, it's like there, there's also a great trust in the mercy of God. Yes. Um, which I think is a sign of their sanctity, you know. Um, so uh, because it's, it's so easy to, to think of our own sin and to fall into despair. That's why it's, it's dangerous to, to look at our own sin without first putting ourselves in the presence of God, you know. Yeah. Um, and that can be very dangerous. But I, so I like that a lot because we've talked about this at the monastery because um, there can be this assumption that um, that the holy thing is to just like be a hermit, you know, be away mm-hmm. from, to be away from everything. And, um, but that's, that's not necessarily the best thing for us, at least for a certain time. Yes. So like, so like in our monastery, in our Tipicon, our rule of life, um, there's, you have to be a life professed nun for, for several years. I think it's something like 15 years or something like that in order to that. then become a hermit. Because yeah. it's like, if you, if you can't actually live in community, exactly. And, um, and so I, I see this, I see this in myself, this, this, um, this example or this, this writing on anger by Cashin, um, every time I go on Pustinia. So, or nearly every time. So it's like, I go on Pustinia. I have this radical conversion from some kind of scripture, you know, and I'm just like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I love people. Yep. I love people. I am actually like, I can go out there and love anyone God puts in my path because I now just, I know how to love. Jesus has taught me. Um, And then I come out of Pustinia at Compline and I'm like, they're late. Why are they late? Why is everyone late? Did anyone consider the fact that I'm here? Did anyone slip me a note? No, no one slipped me a note. They're just late. And then I'm like, nah, I don't love people. As you know, as you're paraphrasing it. the brothers Karamazov since we already mentioned that. Right, the yeah. old woman who speaks to Father Zosima. Uh-huh. And she says, uh, I find that the more I love humanity, the more I hate my neighbor or mm-hmm. something to that effect. Yeah. Because humanity isn't late. Right. Humanity <laughs> is inconsiderate. Humanity <laughs> doesn't forget to bring their bins, like their garbage cans in all week. Good Australian People flip. bloody do. Yeah, yeah. exactly. 
But now that that is absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Forgive me if I'm just repeating what I say with Father Boniface, but I, I do remember. Yeah, prior to having kids, especially because when you're married and you don't have kids, provided that you and your wife get along well, my wife and I are very good friends. We basically want to do the same thing all the time. Like we'd hang out, we'd go to a movie, we'd go to a coffee shop, we'd do stuff. There was no imposition upon my will. Mm -hmm. As soon as I had children, they don't care <laughs> if you want to sleep. They don't care if you'd like to be at mass and have a peaceful experience or mm -hmm. pray the Holy Rosary or something like that. They are, they're going to make impositions upon your will. And it's, it's really then that I realized, wow, there's a lot of anger here. There's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that the Lord needs to heal. And I thank God for that because I'm not sure... I mean, I'm sure the Lord brings it. He's going to bring it up in one way or another. So how, do, how, does, that, how does that work with you? I mean, I guess because you live in tense community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so we talk about there's, there's this image. I don't know where it originated. So I don't know if this is an ancient thing or not. But um, there's, there's an image that's used for the monastic life that I love, that it's like being in a rock tumbler. Um, so, so all of us have these like rough edges <laughs> and we're just all knocked around and the edges are hitting each other yeah. and somehow in doing that it's, we're smoothing each other out. Um, but it's like, yeah, it's just, it's, it's such a, it's such a gift and it's, it's a painful gift, but it's like, we, we talk about how like it's monasticism. We, we get this purification. We're all called to this purification, right? Monastics or otherwise. In the, in the East, there's very much this clear idea of monasticism is a, like a sliding scale. It's like all people are called to live monasticism mm. to the extent that they can within their vocation, within their life. And so, so we're all called to, to incorporate that. You know, I know a lot of married couples who like really incorporate monasticism into their home in beautiful ways. But the... Um, you know, like we're praying Vespers with your family tonight. So that's, yeah. that's exciting. Um, we said it on a recording now, so it, you it have to make to, sure it actually happens. Yeah. 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 Um, the, so, so anyways, but it's like in, in monasticism, we get that purification, but in, in a much more like intensified way, which makes it very intensely painful, but also just like the, the reward and, and the, the, the fruits that we're receiving from it and the joy in which we're living and the, the freedom that we find is just incredible. Mm. You know, um, can I so. ask a personal question? I'm going to, um, what is some of the rough edges that you came into the monastery with that you believe the Lord has already began to smooth, even if you're not sort of, Oh man. Yeah. Maybe um, we should ask mother Gabriella. <laughs> yeah. We should, <laughs> we should save that for the end. We can just answer for each other. Cause um, it's, it's easy to talk kind of generally about it. But everyone's yeah. dealing with their own specific thing that just kind of sometimes feels like it's going to beat them. It's yeah. really going to overcome them. And so yeah. I think speaking specifically about these yeah, things. Yeah, I'm helpful. I'm totally I'm totally open to that. I mean, anyone who's met me for like more than five minutes would realize these things. So it's it's not even very vulnerable. Um one of the things is uh I have very strong opinions. And and I had to learn I mean, I'm learning this all the time, but um it still isn't totally purified. None of the things I'm about to say are. But I, I'm, I'm learning that, like, maybe my opinion isn't the best one. Despite or, how you feel. I know. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, or maybe even, even if it is objectively the right idea, maybe it doesn't have to be expressed. <laughs> so that's crazy. <laughs> And, um, so that's, that's like one of the things is just learning that I don't have to just speak every opinion that comes into my mind. Yes. Um, unless I'm being interviewed by Matt Frad, the, <laughs> but, but this would be a very awkward interview if you just chose to fast from speech. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, you just have one big monologue. Um, so I could just read from the philocopter the whole time. The, <laughs> Honestly, that would be cool. <laughs> um, I have lots of underlines we can just oh, go through and so I can just sweet. read my, my underlines. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so that's one of the things. That's that's um, a huge thing that I honestly don't think a lot of people realize a lot of the time, mm -hmm. because other sins are sort of more obviously um, uh, negative, and people react to them negatively. You know, like if I'm sort of swearing like a sailor, or if I'm watching inappropriate things, or if I if my hygiene is bad, although that's necessarily a moral ill, but it might be. If I'm just sitting around the couch all day, like I'll very quickly you know, have someone push back against that stuff. But that's not always the case. If you have a sort of charming personality and you're trying to put forth an idea that's good. Right, yeah. And so getting to mortify 
that sin that others may not, I mean, maybe they do if you live in close proximity with them all the time, mm-hmm. aren't necessarily pushing back against. It's almost like a thankless mortification in yeah. a sense. Does that make sense? Right. Like they don't know that I'm holding back on yeah, this thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. There's um, another, another big one for me is that um, I, oh gosh, what was I about to say? It's um, mortification. I don't remember what it was. Um, It'll come. Any more funny jokes? No, but um, one thing that struck me when I did my eight day last year with the mm-hmm. Father's uh, Holy Resurrection Monastery in uh, Wisconsin was just the, the just. I, I was reading Teresa of Avila's, uh, what's it called? The uh, castle one? Yeah, Interior Castle. Interior castle. And just how important humility is. Mm. Like, I'm, I, I would love to do like a little word count on that. I'm sure humility is mentioned more than any other word. Just like, basically, if you're humble, you'll be saved. You're not humble, so let's work on that kind of thing. And those times that you think you're humble, as soon as you kind of recognize it, you sort of poison it, (laughs) you know? Yeah. And so it's it's not even like you can come up with a list of things to do to humble yourself. Mm -hmm. Because then you may just interiorly congratulate yourself for doing that thing that's going to make you more humble and thereby not be humble. You know, Cashin um, Cashin talks about how um, when he's talking about the eight evil vices, he says that um, the one that's the most difficult to combat is um is vainglory um because what does he mean by vainglory as opposed to pride um so oh gosh i knew that you were gonna ask that <laughs> I think as soon as it came um, out like don't say it yeah i know um it's it's really hard for me to to distinguish between the two that's okay um so he um he says the vice of self-esteem vainglory mm. um is difficult to fight against because it has many it has many forms and appears in all our activities in our way of speaking in what we say and in our silences at work in vigils and fasts in prayer and reading in stillness and long suffering but he says um but he says that the the tricky nature of of self-esteem or a vainglory is that um when we or maybe he is talking about pride at this point i don't remember but Anyways, the vainglory and, and pride are very difficult for me to distinguish between the two. But um, that, yeah, the tricky nature of it is it's the, it's the one vice that as we defeat it, <laughs> mm. it becomes more of a temptation, you know, because of exactly what you're saying. Like if I'm achieving yeah. humility, yeah. then I'm tempted to think, look at me, I'm so humble. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. I, so, yeah, um, in my mind, the way I distinguish between the two, I don't know if this is totally accurate, is that vainglory is more about um how i see myself Mm. as amazing Mm. pride is more about um making sure others see me as amazing or i might have just flipped those yeah well either way i mean defining what we mean by our terms whether they're accurate (laughs) technically or not i see the distinction yeah 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 it's it's but that that's so those are two that those are the two of the ones that he combined uh have you this sounds like i'm going off topic i'm not have you read the lord of the rings I have, yes. There's that part at the end where Frodo takes the ring for himself, right, mm-hmm. at Mount Doom. And Smeagol jumps on him and bites it off and ends up falling into the... You didn't even give a spoiler alert. Yeah, well, if you haven't read The Lord of the Rings or watched it by now, that's on you. That's how I feel. I just I just read it like two years ago. <laughs> well, see, if we did this three years ago, that would have been very disappointing for you. Okay, so I should have done a spoiler. I should, have done a, I should okay. have done a spoiler. But um, when Frodo is sort of outside of Mount Doom with Sam, his immediate reaction isn't like, I cannot believe I fell to the power of the ring. Like, how hopeless am I? It was immediately like something to the effect of Gandalf said, we, we would never see, we, we wouldn't know the end and that Smeagol still might have a part to play. Hmm. But again, there was that gentleness with himself, which mm-hmm. is real true humility, I yeah, think. Because the times that I fall to a sin and then beat myself up and hate myself, I mean, that quote that's a quote from St. Francis de Sales. He says, like, when we do that, this comes not really a, from a place of love of the Lord, but a, of a place of we, we feel sad to see ourselves so low mm-hmm. as if we're shocked that we could possibly fall to that level. Right. We shouldn't be shocked by our own sin. Yeah. One, one of the most one of the most helpful books I've read, um, because this is a huge job. I, I've, I've really struggled um, in my life with uh, with scrupulosity, um, particularly in the sense of of overreacting to my own sin. Also, maybe seeing weaknesses as sins, but but more so just like overreacting to my own sin. Mm-hmm. Um, 
which can oftentimes become the greater sin. But mm-hmm. one of the one of the books that was most helpful, I always like to give book recommendations, but the one of the ones that was most helpful to me was um, How to Profit from Your Faults by Joseph Tissot. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 using the the spirituality of St. Francis de Sales. But one of the one of the parts of it that I liked the most was he he says that we should be most grateful when we're falsely thought to have sinned, because mm-hmm. then we get all of the positive benefits of having sinned, like the humility and the like all of these things and yeah. he's like without any of the negative aspects of sin itself <laughs> and i'm like yeah i'm not there but i know um, how hard is that but eh? that book's just like amazing but so, it's so really spot on like if if the main thing that concerns me and occupies me is my relationship with the beloved and his opinion of me and me doing his will mm-hmm. as opposed to what a thousand people out there in the periphery think about me which right. really in comparison to what he thinks about me, matters nothing. And that's that's humility. What you just said is, he, I'm not saying you're humble. I don't know if I can speak to that. But what you just said is like, I think a good definition of humility because too many people think that, myself included for a long time, think humility is just thinking like, I'm a piece of crap. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually humility is is seeing ourselves in right relationship with God. Yeah, you know, yeah. um, seeing ourselves as he sees us yeah. Um, humility is really just like a recognition of truth of, of our littleness, not our like despicableness or something. So yeah. as you're talking, I'm thinking of anecdotes to share, but now I'm wondering if they're coming from a place of pride, <laughs> which is probably a sign that I'm prideful because I care about being perceived as prideful and I'm sharing that to look humble. Who the hell knows where I'm at? Um, <laughs> but there's that quote from CS Lewis. He says, uh, Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less, which mm, I like a lot. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I like that a lot too. Hey, how did you get into reading the Eastern Fathers? Because, um, you know, after I read Way of a Pilgrim and got like, did the two things everybody does after having read that book, Chalky, Bilicalia, boom. Mm-hmm. Um, I just found it difficult to enjoy the Eastern Fathers. <laughs> and even now when I read them, I think, yeah, this is, I'm sorry, like this is not as good as Francis de Sales. This is not as good as Teresa of Avila. This is not as good as Thomas oh. Aquinas. Slap me, go. I'm not going to slap you because did you, okay, I'm done. Okay, but you were a Western Catholic at some point. So did you have a transition to sort of... Uh, f- I So I didn't really. Um, so I... I was, I was raised Roman Catholic. My whole family left the Catholic Church when I was in high school, and I was really poorly catechized growing up. Like, I don't I don't know if I even really, I don't think I knew about the true presence in the Eucharist. Like, very poorly catechized. Um, no fault of my parents. Well, maybe some fault of my parents, but, like, really, they, they also were poorly catechized, you know. Um, but then I came back to the Catholic Church in college and within a year discovered the Byzantine right. Oh, I so I didn't really know that yeah. much about the the Roman right before becoming Byzantine. Well, um, but maybe there's this though still. I mean, those authors that I mentioned mm-hmm. lived 500 years ago or something, not 1,600 years ago. So I suppose right. that's it too. There's a big emphasis and thank God there is on the mm-hmm. fathers of the church in the East. There should be more in the West. Thomas Aquinas, massive fan of the fathers. Um, so I suppose maybe that's it. Like some, sometimes reading the fathers, it just feels like it's not connecting with me and I feel bad about that. And I don't know how, do I have to pretend that it's connecting with me? That's obviously not the answer. Right. Did you ever have that or how did you get introduced to the Eastern Fathers? Um, I, I, I didn't. But I, I would say, um, first of all, my piece of advice would be don't do what Matt did and don't start with the Philokalia. Mm. Um, that's probably not the most gentle introduction. Um, because what you have to remember is for the Philokalia, like these are hardcore ascetics, um, monks who are living just mm. extreme lives in the desert, writing for other monks who are living hardcore extreme lives in the desert. You know, um, so so you have to you have to know the context, right? Like that makes sense. It's the whole like text without context is no text at all kind of thing. And um, that's I'm quoting Father Sebastian Carnazzo on that, I think, which he probably got it from somewhere else. But um Anyways, so so there's that. I would um, one of the things that I really loved. Well, I I really like the writings of of Origen, um, which is a little bit awkward because like some of the some of the things that may or may not have been heresy and so on and so forth. But um, the well, some of the things just are heresy. But anyways, the um, there is. What what got me, I'll say this, what got me first into the Eastern Fathers was probably just like little snippets I'd seen used in other things. So yeah. one example of this, uh, have you ever read Cantata of Love? No. Oh, 
Read cantata of love. Really? You're not going to take my How do you spell it? No, I will. I'm writing it down. Um, How do you spell it? Uh, cantata, C-A-N-T-A-T-A. -A -T -A. Okay. You need to flip your pen. Yeah. What does that mean? Um, song. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Of love. Who wrote it? Uh, um, Sorry, I'm really Blaise, putting on the... No, it's okay. Blaise Armignon is maybe how you say the last name. A-R-M-I-N-Y. J O N. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's maybe a Jesuit. Is he Jesuit, Mother Gabriel? Yeah. Um, it's a verse by verse reading of the Song of Songs. Oh. Yeah. I need to read it now. Uh, with commentary by Stop it. Uh, Teresa of Avila, Bernard of Clairvaux. Um, but he's oh also got a lot in there of like um, Origin, John Chrysostom. So he's got he's got some wow. like Eastern stuff in there as well. Okay. And so so that's one of the things that. I think is helpful. Like I can now read just the Desert Fathers and love it. Yeah. I can yep. read the Ladder of Divine Ascent by yep. Climacus, which is so intense, mm -hmm. and love it because I have the context and because I have the context of all of the things that we sing in the liturgy um, every day and things like that. Uh, so as you're kind of living out this spirituality, you start to be able to 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 understand it a little more and apply it a little more, but. Without that or until you're there, I think it's helpful to read things in which other people are using yes. the Eastern Fathers in context. That and makes, that's what that something sense. like this book does. So, okay, so Cantata of Love, is there another one you'd recommend? Um, I'll think of that and I'll maybe come back to it after the intermission or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So, Or we can ask during the intermission. Yeah, but that's a really good point because the, the, the things I just mentioned, right? Francis of DeSales, he's writing to people in the world. Right. Uh, Thomas Aquinas is, believe it or not, at least in the theology, writing for beginners, maybe even just beginning theology students. Teresa of Avila is different. She's writing to assistants. You know what? But... Here's, here's another example. Um, there's, there's a book, a big green book, and it's called, it's, it's fairly expensive, so I'm sorry about that, but it's called um, uh, The Orthodox, the, do you remember what it's called, Mother Gabriel? The, or, the Green Bible. The Bible and the Holy Fathers. And what it is, is it's got the daily readings for the year. Oh, the the daily readings it. in the East are different than in the West. But it's mm -hmm. got the daily readings for the year. But there's also an index in the back. So if you wanted to try to find, like, the daily Roman readings, you could do yep. that. So it's got the daily readings for the year. And with each reading, it has um, a uh, some, some sort of excerpt, like a homily or something like that, by one of the church fathers on that reading. That's lovely. So it'll have, That's like, lovely. it'll have John 6 something and then... A homily by Saint John Chrysostom on John six, and so so this is another really good one because it's like these are homilies that are being given to the people yeah. in the churches, you know. So so typically it's there's mm. there's one on there that's this uh, this homily on Saint John Chrysostom on friendship. That's like I use this as as my um, litmus test for friendship now. Like mm. it's just so beautiful. Have so. you ever heard of the Cantea Aurea by Thomas Aquinas? Uh -uh. Okay, so. What he does is it's a commentary on the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in which he only quotes the Church Fathers to mm. comment on the verse. So none mm. of it's his own. And he actually quotes Chrysostom more than any other father. There you go. Yeah. So that's it's that's a that that would be I another mean Chrysostom, way. the golden tongue. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This so this that's always why I try to give if I ever go to an ordination, I buy that. Mm. But yeah. Here's how to do better homilies. Thomas Aquinas giving you the father's commentary have on you, the gospels. Have you ever heard of Cantina? The app? No. Oh yeah, that's probably that. They pro I mean, there's an app in which it steals that. That probably is it. Okay. I think yeah. it means the golden chain. Okay. So for those who don't know, Cantina is this app you can download, and it's got it's got the whole Bible, and then you oh. can click on any verse in the Bible. Yeah. And it pulls up like a bunch of commentary by Eastern Fathers. I so. bet you that's based on Thomas Aquinas' work. There you go. There you go, bear. And they said baby, but that felt inappropriate, so I went, bear. <laughs> yeah, it's better <laughs> to call me bae. Bae, what's okay, up? Okay, maybe not. All right. Hey, you, I imagine one of the reasons you took your postinia was because you're about to make your life profession. I am. <laughs> okay. So how long have you been in the monastery oh. and what does it mean to make your life profession? Um, so I've been in the monastery for six years. Um, and the, I technically... Should have made. I was going to make my life profession last May, mm. as you know, mm -hmm. um, and but it was delayed because COVID's the worst, and the and then it was delayed again, and then delayed one more time. So this is this is the one. It's happening September twenty sixth. It's going to be live streamed. I'll be there. Um, yeah, like at the life profession, not live streamed. 
Um, no, I won't be there at the live stream. Yeah. I'll, I'll be there at there. I can't wait. I know. Yeah, I'm really excited. Um, I can't the, wait for my kids to see it. I'm so my girls. excited. Yeah. I've told my girls that they're welcome to marry a man if they can find one who loves them more than Jesus. Oh, that's if good advice. If they can't, any full-length habit's fine with me. Oh, that's nice. But but mostly they should enter our monastery. Hey, that's why you're here tonight. I start working <laughs> on them right now. <laughs> I just see you in the corner, like, talking to them, like, hey, Sister Natalia, come, stop. <laughs> Um, like handing them pamphlets. The, and yeah, exactly. <laughs> reading to them in um, their sleep. Yeah. It's getting creepy. You go. Yeah, thanks. Um the so actually the we um we brewed beer for the for the reception for the life profession. Oh, that's amazing. And we brew beer with a, a priest friend of ours, shout out to Father Scott Goodfellow. And so we, we do it for uh, some of our events. But um Mother Gabriella and I are Did you bring any beer tonight? We didn't. No. Oh, Sorry. I guess I'll have to come to the bloody life profession. <laughs> I guess you'll have to come. Maybe not maybe like bloody and life profession. Sorry, shouldn't. it's an Australianism that yeah. I still haven't gotten rid of. Um so anyways, one of the brews that we beard Nope. One of the <laughs> beers that we brewed in, <laughs> nope, was, uh, I haven't even been drinking beer, um, a Belgian triple because those are my favorites. Mm -hmm. And Father Michael Lachlan came up with the name for the beer and it's going to be called Triple Delayed. Okay, I don't get it. Because my life profession was delayed. Thrice. Oh, lovely. That's funny, right? I like it. Yeah. So. Will anyways. you have cool little uh, labels? Um, we'll have it in kegs and distribute oh, it from into cups. Just from, one giant <laughs> label for the keg. Yeah, just one giant keg stand. <sighs> That's so beautiful. That's um, so beautiful. So, I love how the East celebrate. We can do that in a minute. Keep going. Final okay, profession. So yes, um, life profession. Life so profession. So six years I've been there. Um, so in our monastery, the first stage is one year with up to a year extension. So one to two years. And then the second stage is three years with up to a year ex extension. So up to four years. Um, so the whole process is anywhere from four to six years. Mm -hmm. um, more if you're in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so that's how long I've been there. What a life profession is. Um, so this is the moment at which um, I am agreeing to be at this monastery or to another monastery if my hegumena, the abbess, um, sends me there for the rest of my life. So I'm professing to be here for the rest of my life, living this life of, of penance and asceticism. Um, what, I, what I really, really want to make clear, and I think I'm going to put, I'm going to write a letter to people and put it in the life profession booklet because, you know, they're like, they're early and they're bored. And so instead of praying, they're going to like read through the booklet and yeah. whatever. Um, so now everyone's going to feel shamed when they come to the life profession <laughs> and they're reading the booklet. But the... It'll just say, why aren't you praying? Yeah, that's Again, what the whole letter the is going to say. Thing. Yeah, I'm great at shaming people. Um, so the I'm going to write this letter because I think that a lot of people, they, they come and they see a life profession and um, and they just see this woman who's giving her whole life to the Lord. And and that is true. That is what's happening, right? But they see this and they they see this as like, this is the epitome of holiness. This is a woman of virtue. This is a woman who is, is Mother Gabrielle laughing? <laughs> <laughs> she was snickering a little bit. <laughs> She's like, I think the sister is always virtuous. <laughs> um, like this is the epitome of holiness. This is a woman who's who's just so virtuous and that um, like, isn't this beautiful? Isn't this wonderful? Isn't this joyful? And And some of those things are true to an extent, but that's not actually... That's mm. not actually like the primary reality of what we're right. seeing in a life profession. So I brought, I brought the, I just happened to have a life profession service Amazing. with me. Amazing. Um, but it's, 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 it's a, not like the gold medal that you've received for your, that right, you've perfected right. the life of it's virtue. Not like, You're entering into repentance. Right, exactly. So, um, so at the life profession, I, at some point, just a little bit into, it's in the context of divine liturgy. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be a hierarchical divine liturgy. So we'll have the vesting of the bishop and then um, early on in the liturgy, uh, I'll go back. I'll go to the back with Sister Petra because she's making her life profession at the same time. Wonderful. We'll go to the back and we'll start the liturgy wearing what we normally wear at liturgy. So like this with mm -hmm. with our robe and our soft hat. We'll go into the back, get changed into a white garment, um, and no shoes, no watch, no, like nothing like that. Right, just the white garment, barefoot. No veil, hair down. My hair is down to my knees at this point. This is my only chance to see it. I, only chance. Yeah. yeah. So don't mess it up. Matt. I won't. 
Okay. Head down to your knees at this point. That's yeah. crazy. Uh -huh. How do you even hold it back? It's doesn't matter. A vocation crisis. Okay. <laughs> um, every day. Uh -huh. So the and then we actually at the first profession delay. I think I cried. And I think I cried because it meant my hair was going to have to keep growing. Not so much because of that. <laughs> Anyways, so we, we walk down the aisle. And as we're walking down the aisle, um, we make three prostrations. And then at the last prostration, we, we remain prostrate. And then um, the bishop ends up, he, he says some things. And then he takes our hand and, and helps us arise. And uh, what's, what's interesting, though, is as we're walking down the aisle, first of all, we're not singing like here comes the bride and we're not singing we're not even singing um oh virgin pure which is one of the uh i don't know if you know this hymn the, yeah, i think so um, oh virgin pure immaculate mm -hmm. we're, we're not singing this um what we're singing is the troparian of the prodigal son mm. because we're 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 saying um the and the troparian of the prodigal son is haste open wide your fatherly arms to me for i have lived like the prodigal prodigal common misconception <laughs> does not mean one who's returned mm. right prodigal means reckless or or lavish like mm -hmm. we call him the prodigal son because of his recklessness and lavishness not because he returned so i've lived like the prodigal i've lived a reckless life oh savior do not despise my impoverished heart the heart that gazes upon the fathomless wealth of your mercy for i cry out to you O lord with repentance father i have sinned against heaven and before you that's what we're singing as we walk down the aisle and and we make these prostrations and in the east so so people often ask uh why don't we traditionally in the in the eastern liturgy we don't kneel during the consecration and and you know this is especially for a roman catholic who's coming to a divine liturgy for the first time this is very bothersome mm. and and it's very understandably bothersome because it can seem like we we don't have the reverence or something that you might um that you might expect but the reason we don't kneel is because kneeling was actually well anyways i won't get into that but in the in the east, um, in the west, kneeling is a sign of humility. Right. So you kneel during the consecration out of humility. This totally makes sense. In the east, kneeling is a sign of penance. And the divine liturgy or the mass is not meant to be penitential. It's meant to be a celebration. And so so there's no kneeling allowed during the divine liturgy. In the east, the sign of, of humility is a bowing. So we, we do a, a profound bow. We touch the ground during the consecration. Um, so, so anyways, the fact that we're prostrating here, if kneeling is a sign of penance in the East, prostrating is like extreme penance in the East. And so, so as we're going down, we're going down in, in repentance. <laughs> and then, um, and it says, it says in the service, um, after this, this prostration, the last prostration, she does not rise immediately, but remains prostrate, praying silently to the Lord that her sins be forgiven and that she may be received into the ranks of the penitent. And this is what you were saying, right? That like, I'm, this is, I'm, I'm asking to enter into this life of penance. Um, so I'm, I'm asking to, to be a penitent. You know, one of the monks at Holy Resurrection, uh, the, um, that you were talking about earlier, he came and gave a retreat at our monastery one time. And he said, he said, when you make those prostrations at your life profession, your prayer should be, Lord, I need this life of recovery. I need this life of healing. And so, so anyways, I just like mm. to be very clear for I people. Think it's like, beautiful to think of the I'm here because of I'm recovery. a sinner. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah. here because I'm a saint. I'm here because I want to be a saint. Mm. Um, and so, so anyways, I was, I was praying with this in my life profession and I was like, you know what though? I, so I think that it, it is absolutely true that it's a joyful celebration and there's, there's so much rejoicing there. But, but I think that the reason it's so joyful is because we know that there's more rejoicing in heaven over one repentant sinner mm. than 99 righteous, right? And so like, that's why this is joyful because I'm saying, Lord, I've lived this life of recklessness and, and I want to remain reckless to some extent, but I want it to be a reckless love for you, not a reckless life of sin. Mm. And so like a conversion of recklessness of sorts. Mm. Um, so yeah, so. Yeah, that's beautiful. So you want to become a prodigal in that you, you know, you, uh, you become reckless in your repentance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So that's uh -huh. what a life profession is. But it's, so there's a lot of symbolism um, of baptism. So like the white garment, the three prostrations are symbolic of the three dunks at baptism. So in the East, um, 
to be very clear about our sacramental theology, we do not believe you can be baptized more than once. You are baptized once. However, in the East, a life profession is seen as the closest you can get to a second baptism. Um, so there's a lot of baptismal imagery and there's a lot of prodigal son imagery. So um, at one point, the so the bishop um, helps to clothe us with all of the new garments and things like that. We get we get new everything. We get new sandals, new um, new veil, new all of that stuff. So um, chotki. new chotki. We Ooh. get a three hundred knot chotki instead of um, is that what you have, mother? She has a three hundred knot. Mm -hmm. um, How does that not hit the floor? Uh, they loop it up Good. several times. Yeah, yeah. Um, and sometimes put it in the pocket. Um, so the the bishop actually kneels. This is one of the most moving parts of the ceremony for me. But the bishop kneels down. And he puts the sandals on our feet, which is which is very much prodigal son imagery. Uh, we will get a wedding ring, which is something that our monastery in particular does. But the, the bishop will put the well, mm -hmm. just, uh, just a gold band, mm -hmm. and it says ICXC on it. Yeah. Um, uh, and then on the inside, we each have a verse that we we put inside a scripture mm. verse. Um, Can I ask what yours is, or is mm -hmm. it? A Mine is Song of Songs four seven. You are all beautiful, my beloved. There is no blemish in you, uh, and which was a verse that I had already picked out because it was just on my heart. But then really the the profundity of why it was on my heart became very clear on my retreat with Father Boniface. So um, it really like became enlightened uh, later after I had chosen it. It was very beautiful. Um, but uh, anyway, so the bishop will put the ring on our finger. Mm. And who will uh, cut your hair and what is it a symbol of? Also the bishop. Mm -hmm. um, so actually that's a, one of the one of the one of our favorite lines of the service um and by favorite i mean we always have to try not to chuckle but it says <laughs> um it says free her of all carnal desire and irrational notions so that just as she will lose the senseless hairs in tonsure she may also lay aside all senseless designs and actions so anyways it's a it's a sign of um just oh senseless yeah all right, gotcha. <laughs> it's a sign of, of dying to the world yeah. and the like the things that we um do for the world you know especially because um like i mean it's i'm adding this to it i guess because it's the same in a male's monastic tantra like um monks and nuns especially in the east like everything's the same um we don't have beards but abuna moses likes to say that these are our um nun beards <laughs> but the um so anyways especially for a woman like the hair is very much you know her glory yeah. and so to just say like done with that that senseless so where does he cut thing. it off it's not just a little bit it's he lops right it off so he does he does or... like a, a little clip little snips in the sign of the cross yeah. um and then yeah he'll lop it off at the the shoulders and, and i am like, hallelujah oh man must I'm make so summer excited. summer's easier must be very <sighs> everything hot. everything easier yeah shampoo oh my goodness conditioner brushing it i had to <laughs> so i was running late this morning i like i like go to Mother Gabriella's cell and I was like, I'm gonna be like 10 minutes late. My hair had a lot more knots than I realized. Ah. And it's just, it's horrible. But Oh my goodness. Well, that sounds so, so beautiful. And I'm so excited to be yeah. there. I'm really excited that you're coming. Yeah. What will it mean for you? I mean, practically, there's obviously, um, you know, committing yourself to the Lord. And, and what are you committing yourself to? The monastery or to your, your mother, uh, your the head mother? What's her name? Hegumena, yeah. Mother Theodora. Hegumena. Mm -hmm. Are you committing your life to her or to the monastery? Because you said if the Hegumena sends you elsewhere, you would mm -hmm. obey that. So um, one other quick thing that I didn't think to mention about, but I thought of it when you asked Mother Gabriella about her ring. Mm. Um, in the East, the tradition is that every nun at her life profession receives the title mother. Mm. So at my life profession, I'll start being called Mother Natalia. Uh, so so symbolic of our spiritual motherhood of the mm. the fruitfulness of this union with Christ. So in the East, uh, as as you experienced a holy resurrection, all of the all of the monks at their yes. life profession are called father, even if they're um, a brother. Exactly. Yeah. So so Father Anthony is um, is not a priest or a deacon. He's uh, but he's a life professed monk. So mm. um, yeah. So the so I'll be Mother Natalia. Yeah. Um, does your life look different after that, practically? So, there, there's not much, there's not much practical difference because in the in the East, it's also monasticism is very much like the apprenticeship model. So, um, I was, <laughs> I was explaining this to uh, someone from Eastern Europe who uh, English is his second language, and um, and as I was trying to say that, I was like, do you know what apprentice means? And and he said, um, he was like, no, and I was like. And, and I'm like trying to think of how to explain this. And I was like, well, 
you know, in days of old. And then I'm like, did I just say <laughs> days of old? Um, and then I said how they would have clockmakers. And I'm like, really? Clockmakers is the example <laughs> Where is this I used? Coming yeah. From? So anyways, but it's very much the apprenticeship model. So um, so it's like when you enter the monastery, basically from day one, you're living the life of a nun. Mm, um, so you have like, you're given all the obediences, you're on the same schedule, you're all of those things, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, which is a really beautiful, beautiful way to, to discern it, you know? Um, so, um, so not much changes practically. The, the only things would be, I mean, there are certain things just that are in canon law about like votes on the council and things like that. But, um, the, the biggest thing would be that spiritual direction is very much a, if you want to use the, the Western term charism, like that's very much a charism in the East. And so mm. life professed, life professed nuns, um, at that point are allowed to give spiritual direction. And because again, we're, we become spiritual mothers. Um, that so that's, that's probably beautiful. the biggest practical difference. Um, I can't really think of any other practical differences. So have you ever read, um, imitation of Christ, Thomas mm. Kempis? Yeah, I've, I've read some of it, not the whole thing. I believe, and this isn't new wisdom, we're kind of talking about it already, but he speaks of how everybody wants to be something that they're not in order to attain holiness. Mm. So the married man thinks if only he could be a priest, he could devote time to prayer. And the priest thinks if only he were a monk or maybe even a husband, you know, then he could raise good family in this culture of ours. But right, if he's a monk, then he could really devote more time to prayer and not have to worry about church councils and church rep uh, uh, repairs. But then the monk thinks if only I were, I were a hermit, and you're sitting here and I'm like, man, if only the church wasn't so sexist, I would love to join your monastery. That's a, that's a joke. <laughs> but, you know, it, it sounds so beautiful. And I'll be honest. And this, there was a part, as you were speaking, there was a part of me that's like, man, if my, if my wife ever passes away, like, I would love to become a monk. But even that is a... I mean, that's, it, that's very much, that's very Eastern, actually. <laughs> but even that is a reaching for something as if this isn't where the Lord has placed me for my right. own sanctification right now. There's still a reaching out as if holiness will be had over there. Yeah. But it can't be had here with the little annoyances I'm expected to put up with and my own sins. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, no, 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 of course yeah. not. Yeah. Um, what, you know, something that I was very moved by is, um, so uh, I don't mean this as a plug, but I guess this is a plug. Um, you know, Father Michael Lachlan, obviously. Yep, um, so he's he's my spiritual father. He's been my spiritual father for about 10 years at this point, um, almost 11 years, actually. And um, so he and I have a podcast together, What God Is Not. And I can talk about the name of that later if you want. But Please, yeah. the um, but the there, you know, I've, I've talked a lot on the podcast about this uh, this sliding scale um, aspect of monasticism that I talked about in the East of, of how we're all called to live monasticism to some degree in our life. Um, I've also shared on the podcast several as several parts of our Tipicon, again, our rule of life at the monastery. And, um, and sometimes I'll like share something from the Tipicon and share how I think this applies to people in the world. Um, but the, our Tipicon, there is, we have a link to it, a, a PDF it's, what is on Tipicon? our website. Quickly Tipicon means rule of life. Okay. So it's, um, it's, uh, so in the East, um, we don't have the same concept. Traditionally, we don't have the same concept of orders that you have in the West. Like we don't have Dominicans, Bazillion, uh, sorry, um, Dominicans, Benedictines, things like that. Um, we do have, um, we do have like like Bishop Milan, our, the bishop of our eparchy of Parma, he's um, he's a Jesuit and he's Byzantine. So mm -hmm. there's like, there are Byzantine priests within the Jesuits, Byzantine priests within the Dominicans, so on mm -hmm. and so forth. But um, but we don't have like the same concept of Byzantine orders. Yes. So what would happen is each, each monastery um, would develop their own typicon, their own rule of life. And um, they're, they're pretty similar. They have kind of the same like, they're, they're mostly based off of, um, like, Pacomius and Basil. Um, mm -hmm. So they're pretty similar, but but they're particular to each monastery. Ours has a lot of emphasis on um, spousal relationship with Christ because we're Christ, Christ the, bridegroom the Bridegroom Monastery. I don't know if we even said that. At the, yeah, I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> But our monastery is Christ the Bridegroom Monastery. Um, mm -hmm. And emphasis on... Um, we really feel a great pull in our monastery to, to pray and work towards... Um, reunification between East and West. So there's some emphasis in that in our in our Tipicon and 
Um, we also feel a great pull to like prayer for priests. Um, and so, so there's some of that, but anyways, um, we have a link to this, our Tipicon on our website, christthebridegroom.org. And so, so anyways, one of our podcast listeners, you know, he, he reached out, he sent an email and he's just like, so, um, I've read through your Tipicon. It's very beautiful. And, um, we're like applying certain aspects of it to our family. And yeah. he's like, um, there's this paragraph, this paragraph and this paragraph. And, and what do you think? And what's your advice on, on how we can better incorporate this? And I just was like, so moved by this, mm. you know, I'm like, this is someone who is a married man and he's loving the Lord and his family is loving the Lord. And they're wanting to incorporate this into their family life and, um, and, and to be holy as married people <laughs> and holy as a family. And, and that's just like, that's what we need. And that's mm-hmm. beautiful, you know, which speaking of the, the Tipicon, um, I just remembered you'd ask the question about whether I'm, I'm promising to stay yeah. with this hegemena or with yes. this monastery. So our monastery, um, we want to always be smaller, like, like family size, large family How size. How many sisters so, is the max? Um, we would probably yeah. never have more than like 15 or 20 right. at our monastery. So we won't have like hundreds, you know, like some monasteries. Yeah. So, so once we have, I don't know, 10 or 12 nuns or something like that right now, there are seven of us. Once we have maybe 10 or 12, uh, mother, the heg- whoever the hegemena is at that time would take two or probably, probably like three of them to go start a new monastery. So after, else. after this podcast, when you get eight more applicants <laughs> and you're bursting at the seams, we had a lot of people reach out after my last interview. You're welcome. You. And yeah. what did I say to you? I said, you need to be giving me a kickback for this. Yeah. And you said something snarky, like shut up. Yeah, that was it. That was probably it. No. <laughs> okay, but so, so another nun would be selected to be the hegemena to start another monastery at that point if you grow beyond 15 possibly? Well, yeah. So um, so so I, so I theoretically, I could be one of the three who's sent to start this new monastery. Beautiful, yeah. Um, I see. So that's why it's um, the service says, do you promise to stay at this monastery or that to which you are sent under holy obedience? It's for situations like that. And so like if that. you were sent to another monastery, you would then be under obedience to that hegemon. Uh-huh, yes. And and so... Um, so if we, once we, once we start a new monastery though, this is what I mean by we don't have the concept of orders. It wouldn't be another monastery and like Christ the Bridegroom Monastery is the mother house. It would be totally independent, like that. totally autonomous. They would need to write their own Tipicon. Mm. And I mean, there would be very much a connection yeah. and constant communication and, and visiting and all of self, that. But it would be. say governing? Mm-hmm, self-contained. Yeah. yeah. So under the authority of whatever, the bishop of whatever eparchy they were in and so on and so forth. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, that's that's really beautiful. Um, do you and this other sister, who will soon be mother, both of you making your mm-hmm. life profession, have the two of you like talked about like your fears, your maybe any apprehension yeah, about sure. this? Yeah. Does, does it yeah, feel like a, a big deal? Like when you like when I got married, um, it was a big deal. It was like, oh, this is it. You There's know, it, no turning back now. Yeah, it 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 doesn't feel. But then we didn't have a six year preparation. Exactly. Yeah. And also, um, it felt, it felt like a really big deal last May. Um, but at that point, by the time, by the time it had come around, you know, like I was committed, I had made my decision. Um, and after the like year and a half of kind of the prolonged, it's, that's all kind of, you know, I've just gotten used to the idea. Um, so (laughs) it's like, I said my big yes a year and a half ago. I just happened to not quite say it publicly yet. Yes, Yes. Um, so it, it doesn't, but at first it did very much feel like a big deal. And, and that's emphasized in the service. Like the, the bishop is saying, you know, several times he says, um, be sure you realize the nature of these promises, which you have made. Uh, and he Mm. says, um, he says, um, give God fitting answers to these questions, fearful and yet joyful. And so there's the whole, the whole profession service has this beautiful tension between, an, an acknowledgement of I'm sinful and I am undeserving <laughs> of, of this opportunity and I'm not actually going to be able to, to fully live out these things that I'm saying I'm going to live out. Um, and that's terrifying. And there's this great weight and this acknowledgement of my sinfulness. And there's the tension between that and God's immense mercy and the trust in his love and the trust that he's going to help me up when I fall. And and all of that. So there's mm. like this beautiful tension throughout the whole service. So. What what uh, what do you see uh, in young women who are discerning becoming a religious? 
um, maybe some of the pitfalls they fall into, uh, some things that they need to be, I don't know, maybe, maybe the way they discern is problematic or, uh, I, 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 like for example, the reason I ask that is I, I talk to young men who are discerning the priesthood and it seems like they're only discerning uh, and that's all they do mm. and there's never a decision made. Or I'll, speaking for myself, I remember when I was discerning the priesthood, I would sort of, I would priest hop as it were. Like I would get super into this one religious order and then I'd check out this other one mm-hmm. and I would never really kind of make a decision. Um, what, what are you seeing as you chat with young women? Um, that is one of the things, <laughs> um, exactly what you just described. But I would say the the, the piece but, but of advice. Spe- but speak to that more, though. I, I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I do. I see the the people who are just like, they're kind of. There seems to be this paralysis of not wanting to take the next step, of not wanting to maybe visit the monastery, or mm-hmm. of not wanting to do an extended visit, or not wanting to do an observership, which is what we call the the first stage of kind of serious discernment in our monastery, where you come for a three to six week visit, mm-hmm. um, or they're not willing to take the step to enter, or something like that. But the, the piece of advice that I usually give to people, and this is something that, that really Father Michael, uh, my, again, my spiritual father, that he helped me along with because I was, I was struggling with that, that kind of paralyzing fear uh, because we're just, we're just so afraid of commitment in our society. Yeah. And, I, and I think it's because we're so surrounded by broken commitment that we, we don't even trust in ourselves to be able to commit. Yep, that makes sense. And, and we see how much the broken commitments damage and, and we even subconsciously just don't want to cause that damage. And, you know, so, um, so the advice that I usually give to people is don't be afraid to take this step because, um, and there's, there is one other big thing that I want to talk about, but don't be afraid to take this step because to, to come visit the monastery is not a commitment to be there forever. To come on observership is not a commitment to be there forever. We've had multiple people come on observership who then didn't enter the monastery and we are friends with them and we love them. <laughs> and, you know, um, one of them in particular, I'm very close, uh, two actually, I'm very close with still. Um, and then um, to enter the monastery is not a commitment to be a nun for the rest of your life. You know, <laughs> it's not even a commitment to be a nun. It's not a commitment to being tonsured. You know, it's like, it's all parts of the discernment. And and what I what I tell people is, if you're, if you're with under the guidance, absolutely under the guidance of a spiritual director and under the guidance of the superior of the community and the community itself, which is the other thing I'm gonna talk about in a second. Um, if you're, if you're wondering, if you're fe- feeling any pull towards this, like, try it <laughs> because if this is something I really needed to hear myself, if I go to the monastery for six months or a year, in fact, even if at this point I discerned out, I will not feel like it was wasted time, you know? And I think that can especially be a temptation for women because we have biological clocks yeah. and it's like, if I'm supposed to get married, I don't want to waste time discerning a monastic yes. life um, when I really should find my husband ASAP so that we can start having kids. And, um, which, by the way, is just like a very utilitarian way of looking at marriage. But, um, but anyways, there is um, if I if if you go to the monastery and you end up after two years discerning out, you are going to be so much better of a wife and so much better of a mother for having spent that two years learning how to pray, learning how to live in community, mm. learning how to love the Lord above all else. Because if you're married, you still need to love the Lord above your husband and above your children. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, it's just the, 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 the time there is so formative that it's not wasted time. And so I think that's probably one of the biggest fears for people is they don't want to pursue this and waste their time. Um, and so that's a fear that I try to allay. But the other thing that I'll say that I think is, is, very um, prevalent in our society is people think that um, their discernment is just that. It's their discernment. And so if I think I'm called to the monastery, then I'm called to the monastery. And um, that's uh, just not all encompassing um, because it's a discernment on the part of the community. Yes. It's a discern very much. And you have no um, interest in forcing people who will be bad nuns in against that exactly. would just make your life more miserable. Exactly. Yeah, and their life. And their life. Um yeah, it's like and that's that's something that honestly um I mean our community has problems, all communities have problems, just like every family has problems. But one of the things that I most appreciate about our community, about Mother Theodora the Hegemena, is that she she has she's never from the beginning, she's never been concerned about the numbers. 
Right. So for her, it's never been like she's never chased after anyone. Um, she's never pressured anyone. In fact, she like probably should have pressured me a little bit more. Um, but <laughs> but maybe she was right because God got me there. But yeah. um, you know, she's just very much like God's will. I want God's will because we all know at our monastery that if if we don't want God's will, we're not going to be happier for it. The discerner is not going to be happier for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's a lose, just, lose. Yeah. Like I, I, at the end of my observership, um, again, that three to six week visit, uh, everyone else, I think everyone else who's entered the monastery, um, either during their observership or immediately after applied to the monastery. Um, I didn't for like a year or something like that because I, at the end of my observership, I was like, I'm not ready. And I, I don't think I can, uh, I probably talked about this a little bit last time, but I, I don't think I can, I can't imagine a happy and holy marriage for myself. And I don't want to do this if I think it's the only way I can be holy. I want to do it if I think it's the way God wants me to be holy. And, um, but not if I think it's the only way I can be holy, because that's not. Do you know, I had the exact opposite experience when I was living in Brisbane. I couldn't imagine myself as a successful husband and father Mm -hmm. in everything that entailed. Mm -hmm. And it was my men's group at the time who pointed that out. So I was very much discerning. So the friars of Uh renewal and very much excited about that and looking into that. And I just thought like every aspect of fatherhood and husbandhood, you know, I'd be a bad father, a bad provider, a bad lover, like everything I would suck at. That's, mm-hmm. that's I was convinced of that. And it was, it was not a good reason to become a priest. Right. And yeah. and so that's what, that's where I felt at the end of my observership. I was like, I can't imagine a happy and holy marriage for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was like, if I enter the monastery right now, it's going to be because I'm, I'm running away from, mm-hmm an unholy marriage. Um, and, and we, we should not discern things because we're running away from, um, another good, you know, it should be because we feel we're called to a a greater good or a different good. And so, so at the end of my observership, I tell mother, um, you know, I I don't think I can apply right now. I think like I, I need to further discern marriage. And she was like, great, go do that. Date if you need to. And you know, (laughs) whatever you need to do. And I'm like, okay, so I leave, I dated a guy. Oh wow. Um, and um, and then eventually, obviously we, we broke up, we did break up. <laughs> and, uh, so, um, so yeah, mother's just been, you know, she's just like, go, you know, God's will be done. And, and father Michael also was very supportive. You know, he's like, uh, whatever God wants. And, um, mm. and she just, she has this great trust and, and confidence in, um, like if God wants this, it'll happen. So. I'm also not sure what the uh, incentive would be for, the mother or the father of a particular monastery to wish to grow unnecessarily. I don't even know what the advantage in that would be. Like having someone come and live with you who ought not to be there would be like me just saying, hey, you want to come live with my family? And just, you can have a spare room and just live with us forever. Yeah, I, Why would I do that? You know, I, I would, they felt called to it and we discerned it as well. Right. I would, I would imagine, I, I obviously don't have any firsthand experience of that because this is my only community. And like I said, that's not a struggle in our particular community. But I would imagine... Um, part of it is just even in the monastery, um, we get attitudes of the world that just seep in. And, and one of those attitudes is like Mm. more nuns looks better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so, so I would imagine, I, I hope that this is the case that superiors who do that superiors who, who press for more nuns, um, or who press for certain people to enter who probably don't have a call to monasticism. I would hope that they're doing it not because they see they don't have a call and are pressing it anyways. I would hope they're doing it because they 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 want these numbers and so they've kind of like self-deceived into thinking this person has a call. Yeah. You know, it's more like it's more like they're they maybe get the intuition that this person isn't supposed to be here but they kind of like push that aside and yeah. convince themselves. So yeah. I would hope that when they do it, they've convinced themselves this person has yeah, a when call. I, when but... I was discerning the priesthood back when I was 17 in Australia, it did feel like, at least to me, and maybe I was misreading it, but it felt like some of the religious orders I had contacted were like, please God, save our dying community. And that's not attractive. Exactly. It'd be like me meeting an old woman who's like, please let me have children. I'm like 40 and this can't go on forever. Please marry me. I'm like, ah, first of all, you're 23 years older than me, which is weird. <laughs> so. You also just, to all your listeners, called 40-year-old women old. I know. Well, older than me. I was 17 <laughs> at the time. That's why I said 24 years old, 23, 24 years old. Yeah, like it's just not attractive, like to be begged into something. It's, right. it's not attractive in religious life. It's mm-hmm. it's not attractive in kind of romantic life. Yeah. But we, so, but that, so anyways, that, that's, we, but the point, I think just yeah. quickly, the point you were making is so important that people realize. It's like 
you might discern this, and but you're not the only one in this process. Absolutely. You have yeah. other beautiful holy women who are discerning as well. And right. so you can also trust in that. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. So it's like if you, if you, um, yeah, you know, it's just not like, that's when, all I have to say. On when that. you, st when you join the monastery, because I, when I stayed with those fathers up in Wisconsin, my initial thought was I'm going to like pray with them the whole time. Like every time they pray, I'm going to do it. No, nah, it's like eight hours. That's ridiculous. Overboard. Yeah, at our monastery, from the day you enter, you attend all the same prayer. Way too much. I'm just joking. I'm only wow. being a smarter, a smart aleck. Ah, uh, see how that noise slipped. Um, uh -huh. but yeah, like so, I, I would do like an hour in the morning, hour in the evening. But I was like, I can't do eight hours of this stuff. Was there? That's how did you? Drive me crazy. Well, I'm going to keep doing it because this is for your sanctification, <laughs> sister. Um, and the sanctification of everyone who's listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah. So, was there any kind of? Um, did you get? You had to get used to it, kind of thing, or? Um, Cause I mean, tell people how, how much you pray as, as a community. Sure. So we pray, um, we have, we have spousal prayers in the morning, um, which is what we call, uh, because at our monastery, the, the spousal relationship is, is so significant. That's what we call our cell rule, which is the rule of prayer that's given to you by your spiritual mother or spiritual father that you pray in hmm. your, um, in your cell. Um, well, not tech and sometimes we'll like pray it outside or whatever, but anyways, um, so that's an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Um, what is, do you mind if I ask what that consists of? Is that is that very specific to each individual? It's very or specific it... to each individual, but it's typically some combination of silence, Jesus prayer, scripture, maybe spiritual reading. Um, That's really cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, so we have that in the, individually. Um, outside of the great fast, we then have matins or morning prayer. Um, starting with the Jesus prayer, 15 minutes of that. Um, that's about an hour and a half in the morning. And then we have another from 6.30 to 8. And then at noon, we have, uh, we have uh, noon, we pray one of the hours, first, third, sixth, or ninth. And that lasts about 30 minutes. Mm. Um, and then we have Vespers or evening prayer from 4.45 until about 5.45 or 6.00. And then we have Compline or night prayer from 9 to 9.30. And um, so those are the times of communal prayer. Uh, and then we also have, like I mentioned earlier, we have Pustinia mornings on Fridays until noon. And that's time of just prayer and silence. But um, And then during Lent, it's all of those things, but they're all just longer. Mm. Um, but <laughs> so we have during, during Lent or the Great Fast, it's probably another hour hour and a half so it didn't prayer. take you much getting used to um not so much i don't i don't want to sound like ex well, you, i like can imagine you going in with enthusiasm here, right yeah, you want so, to fully commit to this life yeah and, and so also you... i um you know we each have different draws to the monastery and um like just just naturally we each have different calls on our heart and and I really, really, I love liturgical prayer. So yeah. that was one of the draws for me. Nice. So there are other things that were a lot harder for me to transition to. But the liturgical prayer was not so hard. Like, I always wanted more of that at our yeah. parish. And, um, yeah, so I really like that. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are certainly days that I'm like, I'm tired. Yeah. I don't want to get up and go to mat. And yeah, yeah. Uh, it mostly happens with Compline. Like, by the end of the day, I'm just done. And I'm, I'm like, like I don't want to pray to Compline. I don't want to pray tonight. Yeah. Um, what do you do when you, do you have a travel on your own? Probably to see your folks. Yeah, for home visit and, do you and retreat. Keep to that structure. We have different. Um, we have kind of an abbreviated. No, definitely not that structure. But we have abbreviated. We we um, basically more or less we pray morning prayer and evening prayer, mountains and vespers, but abbreviated forms. Hmm. Um, and then also our spousal prayers, our cell rule. So. Awesome. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick break. Great. When we come back, I want to ask you about your excellent podcast with Father Michael, What God Is Not. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to take some questions from our patrons. Great. Cool. All right. I want to say thank you to Ethos Logos Investments for supporting this show, elinvestments.net slash pints. I guess when I was a bit younger, I thought that investing was something that only rich people did or old people did or rich old people did. I didn't realize it was something that I should be looking into as well. And when I began looking into it, I realized I don't want to invest in companies that are doing immoral things. 
And that's where Ethos Logos Investments comes in. They were founded to work with individuals and institutions within the United States that seek to infuse their morals into their investment portfolio, with portfolios that adhere to the US Conference of Catholic Bishops Responsible Investing Guidelines. You can be sure that you aren't profiting from intrinsic evils like abortion, embryonic stem cell research, pornography, or human trafficking. Please go check them out. Ethos Logos Investments is what they're called, elinvestments.net slash pints. There's a link in the description below. elinvestments.net slash pints. For employers, they offer socially responsible and Catholic 401k and 403b options as well. So yeah, go check them out, elinvestments.net slash pints. Securities offered through Securities America Inc., member FINRA SIPC. Ethos Logos Investments and Securities America are separate entities. Advisory services offered through Securities America Advisors Incorporated. Yes. The second group I want to thank is Hallow. Hallo, H-A-L-L-O-W dot com slash Matt Frad. Hallo dot com slash Matt Frad. Hallow is a fantastic app that will help you to pray and meditate. It's not like new age mindfulness apps that lead into wrong ways of thinking. This is 100% Catholic and it's super sophisticated. If you go to hallow.com slash Matt Frad and sign up there, you'll get a few months for free before deciding if you want to pay a minimal amount every month to have access to their entire app. Now you can download the app right now and you'll get access to certain things for free. So be sure to check that out if you just want to you know, play around with it and see what they have to offer. But if you want access to everything that they have, like sleep stories and Bible studies and all sorts of beautiful things like that, you, you, you have to pay a certain amount every month to get access to that. If you want access to everything for a few months, just go to hallow.com slash Matt Frad, hallow.com slash Matt Frad and sign up there. Thanks. back how long did it get to in the two minute countdown before you switched it back uh, 40, seconds. 40 seconds why did oh. we have to do that extra two minute countdown because i had to go to the bathroom you know that why You're would you not ask even me the that girl because i wanted to embarrass you. <laughs> it's the shaming i told you i'm really good at shaming. <laughs> all right sister but so before we get to these uh, questions i wanted to ask you about your what god is not podcast which i think you've been doing for over a year now yeah and it has one of the greatest um logos logos thanks yeah um so, um, the, it's called what God is not because it's a, it's a reference to what's called apophatic theology, mm -hmm. uh, which you're familiar with. So in the, in the East, um, there's this emphasis on apophatic theology, which is, is means that we're talking about, um, what is not. So we say God is ineffable. He's inconceivable. He's all of the, he's, he's sinless. He's all of these things that he's not. And, um, the reason we do this is because the, the other way of speaking is called cataphatic theology, talking about what God, what God is. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, scientists would be familiar with this if you think about cations and anions. And so uh, the um, 
the reason we have the emphasis on talking about what God is not is because our language is so limited that anytime we say something that he is, there's something lacking, right? right. Just like whenever we, we make any sort of analogy, uh, there's always an analogy specifically referring to God. There's, there's always some way in which it fails. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. always a dissimilarity. This is this so. is Thomas Aquinas. Oh, like, It's called the Via Negativa. I don't really know anything yeah, about Thomas Aquinas. you would love him. I don't know if I would. You uh, No, you would. I, listen, I don't know if I've ever shared with you my one experience of, of Thomas Aquinas. You know, I say I don't like Thomas Aquinas. I really love the hillbilly Thomas. Um, yeah. If there are any hillbilly <laughs> Thomas listening... If the I Summa Theologiae you. is anything like Old Blue Thomas, it's <laughs> so, not. But. Um, so, uh, yeah. so anyways, the Summa, actually, yeah. this is my Thomas Aquinas story. Um, mm. I, uh, he helped me to realize um, what a good heretic I'd be. So, so one of the, one of the sisters, I've never, I had never read uh, Aquinas because I was always just like, I have no background in philosophy or theology. My background is in engineering physics. And so I'm like, I, he's just way over my head. I wouldn't be able to understand anything. And then one day, one of the sisters, she's taking a class. And so she's reading from the Summa. And she's like, she's like, listen to this part. And she reads it out loud. And I'm listening. And I'm like, I get it. Mm. I totally get it. Like, I actually understand. It's not over my head. And I'm like, I'm totally, that's on point. I get it. And she was like, that's the heresy that he's refuting. And I'm no, like, oh, that's awkward. That's so <laughs> um, funny. So I would, I would surely just accidentally be a heretic. I, you can't accidentally be a heretic. I would you, accidentally you can, proclaim you heresy. You can be a material heretic. Okay. Most of us, probably all Christians are. Formal heresy is when you... But I just mean that, like, I, I could I could say heresy without being a heretic. Because you're only Totes. a heretic if yeah, you're, Yeah, no, like, absolutely. Doing it I do it in most episodes. There I'm committing heresy quite regularly. Awesome. In fact, I think there was awesome. one person... One time I did a Pints with Aquinas episode and I referred to the two persons of Christ or something like that. That's nothing. <laughs> And, uh, but I, I said it with such, like, you such know, such confidence, like, such confidence <laughs> that people were like, crap, I guess I had no idea. And then, <laughs> so it was cool. So in the next episode, I was like, heresy alert, heresy alert, <laughs> speaking about humility. Uh, yeah, that was good. So, yeah, no, what, what God is not. So, so yeah, what God is not. So good. it's, it's a podcast that I do with, um, with my spiritual father, Father Michael O'Loughlin. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the comments that we got, so, so. It's a very conversational podcast, just like just like what we're doing right now, you know. Um, well, not so. It's not like interview form, but it's just uh, we take turns picking topics, and it's uh, he's he's an Eastern Catholic priest, and so it's um, a Byzantine podcast. But um, so there's like that that Byzantine spirituality there, the emphasis on the mystery. But um, most of our listeners are Roman Catholic. But the it's it's beautiful because there's so much in it that like people are just seeing a glimpse into our relationship as mm -hmm. spiritual father and spiritual daughter. And that's one of the things that I've, that we've gotten the most positive feedback about is people are like, it's so beautiful to see this celibate love yeah. and this, this chaste love and to be able to experience that and, and witness that. And, um, someone recently pointed out, they were like, you know, what's so great about your podcast is it's the only podcast I know of. This is what the person said. It's the only podcast I know of um, Catholic podcast that's um, a man and a woman who aren't married. Uh, Interesting. And I'm like, oh, like there's, you know, there are yeah. priests who have podcasts together. There are religious women, religious men who have yep, podcasts. Yep. Husband uh, and wife. Husband and wife. Um, but yeah, that's really interesting. So, isn't it? Yeah. And so it's just been, it's been a really beautiful experience. So, and we just, we talk about a, a wide variety of things. I mean, Father Michael did a whole, a whole series on the divine liturgy. Um, mm -hmm. It was like a seven part series or something like that. I joked that it was never going to end. It was going to be like, <laughs> Part twelve A, the Great Amen, yeah. and um, you hear you snoring in the background. Seriously, and uh, so, anyways, he actually people really liked that that series though. So he did a I whole bet. series on on the Divine Liturgy. Um, but we've talked about um, uh, I don't know. I did I did an episode on um called No Safety Net that which which was just about um loving the Lord single heartedly and and just really going all in and things like that. Um. And yeah, it's awesome. it's a great thing. Wherever podcasts are found, right? Spotify, iTunes, What um, God Is yeah, Not. Yeah, all of the things. Yeah, it's cool. called What God Is Not, and it's on all the major Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Um, you, we have a YouTube channel. Oh, all of sweet. That, so, do you guys video it as well? Um, we don't do video right now, so it's sure. just the whatever the little squiggly lines. Squiggly things. lines. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think I know what you mean. Like to, for the audio. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Squiggly all right, lines. we have <laughs> we have questions from patrons. Big thanks to everybody who supports Pints with Aquinas. Uh, Christopher West is in the oh, chat. That's amazing. Love him. 
Um, love you, Christopher. Hi, Christopher. That's we love you. Story too. Is that it? Hey, he didn't have a question. He was just like, <laughs> what's up? All right. So this is funny because this patron's name is your boy, EB. Hey, my boy. No idea. He says, one thing I have come to see is that Roman Catholics sometimes think Byzantine Catholics are weird, not wrong, and have yeah, weird, weird traditions and theology that are foreign to them. What are some theology or traditions of the Byzantine church? Do you, All right. We can do the distinction if you want. Do you think Roman Catholics have misunderstandings about that mm. they should understand and why you believe and do such traditions and theology? God That's bless you, Sister Natalia. Question. Yeah. That's just like opening it up, like opening up the space for me to just clarify these things that yeah. people might. That's great. Maybe choose one or two. Yeah, sure. Because um, there's probably a ton. Well, one of the greatest thing, one of the biggest things that I already touched on um, is that people get some some people get really upset that praying the rosary is not an Eastern tradition, mm -hmm. and and I say it's not an Eastern tradition. I know plenty of Byzantine Catholics who pray the rosary and find great fruit in that, and that's beautiful. Um, but uh, but it's not like a tradition that developed in the East. Um, because, uh, but, but we do have, like I said, lots of other, um, you have something similar to, to it, though. you have something similar to the rosary. I forget the Eastern saint's name, but it's that hail Mary Theotokos mm -hmm. and, yeah. and there's so it's, 150. It's like, yeah. Um, the rejoice O Virgin, I That's think the is one. the, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. um, but we have, we have this, one of my, one of my favorite services is, um, an Akathist, mm. um, which Akathist Love just it. means without sitting yeah. um so it just means you stand the whole time um so the the akathist to the mother of god we have akathists uh we have these services without sitting to to various saints and stuff but the akathist to the mother of god is this beautiful beautiful service and the whole thing is just singing in, about different images of mary so i love um, it so freaking much yeah it's, i would make it's my amazing. kids like We'd, I'd be like, Dad's going to do the Akathist. And they kind of get excited because I would let them like lay on the couch yeah. and put blankets over them. And then Daddy would chant and swing <laughs> incense around for like so half hour. We have, um, one of my favorite lines of it from it is um, we talk about, about the Theotokos, which means uh, God bearer. That's what we call Mary. Um, the where maidenhood meets motherhood. That's one of my favorite lines from it. Mm. But we, we talk about, about Mary being um, the, the bush that burned but was not consumed. And, um, you know, we have all of these images from her um of her from from the old testament of like the ark and and um the mountain and uh out of which the stone was hewn and and things like that um yeah, we we, uh, we so, gotta look it up at some point and we're gonna read through some of them because it's great. like a grade it's, poetry it's amazing um so that's that's one of them is that we don't pray the rosary but we do have lots of other um devotions to the theotokos and and in the in the liturgy we like basically we, we almost never have hymns without ending them with something to Mary. Like at Vespers, we have this set of hymns called the Stachira and this set of hymns called the Apostica. And at the end of them, we always have uh, some hymn to the Theotokos. So we love Mary very much. Did that would be one thing you'd want to clarify to people. Just because we yes. don't have your exact same devotions mm -hmm. doesn't mean we don't have other devotions. Right. Um, and one of the other things is uh, that's not a tradition in the East is uh, adoration. So that's something mm. that, that really can can kind of uh stir up some distrust from from roman catholics uh but what i'll say is um something that one of the other nuns pointed out that i found very very beautiful it like reveals um the profound ways in which god works in the church um like in different ways and different traditions at different times and it's that um, part to, to, to my understanding, part of the reason adoration developed in the West, um, it was a response to people doubting the true presence in the Eucharist. And like there was this, the, these heresies that were developing, right, where people weren't believing in the true presence in the Eucharist. And that's when, um, adoration started, uh, becoming a thing. And, um, and, and that same heresy never really developed in the East. And that's not because we're like these awesome people who never have heresy, but we had different heresies. And so um, the big heresy, Matt, mm. what's the big heresy in the East? The uh, icons being banned. Yeah, iconoclasm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this was people thinking that. So so in the East, we, um, we have lots and lots of icons and we kiss them all the time. And uh, the, <laughs> I was just thinking of a story from the Holy Land, but I, it's, it's fine. Um, the... 
in the East, so the, the big heresy was that people, people started believing that these icons, um, that to kiss them was actually idol worship. That's funny. And, um, Read its head again in Protestantism, which is probably when you right. saw like a full-throated response from the West. So, um, right. And so in the East, one of the, um, this is, this is the, the thing that, that this, one of the other sisters in the monastery noticed that I think is really profound. Um, one of the miracles that you hear about happening in the West is Eucharistic miracles, right? Like mm. hosts that um, that bleed, bleed right? Mm. And things like that. Um, I've never heard, well, anyways. So so that's like one of the big miracles that happens in the West. Yes, in the uh, East, you, the miracles yeah. that, you're ha- that you hear about are weeping icons, miraculous icons. Mm. So it's like God speaks to the wounds of, of each side of the church, each person in the church in like very distinct ways. Um, so, so anyways, we didn't have that particular heresy and, and adoration didn't v- develop in the East, but, um, that's not because we don't believe in the worship, um, of the Eucharist or, or in the Eucharist itself or the true presence, but, um, it's just not a, a tradition that developed. So. Do you, what do you think? I mean, do you enjoy when you get to go to say like a Catholic Western Catholic conference and they have adoration? Do you kind of appreciate it as something some, somewhat exotic that you get to partake in? Um, sure. I mean, when I'm, yeah, when I'm, when I'm at, when I'm in adoration, um, I, um, I mean, I typically just pray with my eyes closed. I don't, I don't typically like gaze upon the host or Why something. Not? Well, so. Why can't you just appreciate it and see that's bloody gorgeous without it having to be something you naturally, just like, I mean, Western Catholics see the chotki, right? Or they mm-hmm. see the icons. They're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah. And they can recognize it as part of the Eastern heritage without having to necessarily adopt it or to insist that their particular church adopts sure. it. Sure. Well, so, so, but, but what I'm saying is in adoration, like I can appreciate that we're here in the presence of the Lord in mm-hmm. his very real presence. Um, and I can enter into that more fully um, by closing, in my, closing my eyes and resting in his presence. I don't need to gaze upon, um, like to gaze upon the Eucharist does not remind me of his presence any more than than simply closing my eyes and resting in the presence cool i could i could keep asking questions but oh, i'm afraid it would seem combative so <laughs> I, you tell me if you want me to or not i mean you can i don't care i'm not afraid of it yeah <laughs> i'm not a, <laughs> it's stupid i'm not afraid of you but um yeah i don't know so, i don't, so I don't me, like what you just said that's I fine i don't like it so hey, let me finish um i i get i i get I, I think I see what you're saying. I mean, there's there's something particular to how one chooses to pray, and someone might even see gazing upon the monstrance and all this is somewhat distracting, and that's fine. But it just seems to me that if this is truly the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, why, without having to, to have without having to feel the need to adopt this practice, why not see it as something incredibly beautiful and praiseworthy, and then choose to gaze upon the Eucharist? Why? Is it just a particular preference that you have? Or do you think it's because you're an Eastern Catholic, you're like, I don't really get it, so I'm gonna shut my eyes and it's I may as well be before an icon. Um Yeah, I think it's I think it's probably a, a particular preference, but I, I think it's also um I, I think it's also is just coming from from the eastern spirituality of you know what we're like how we were talking earlier about um i can i can more um i can more easily read and accept the teachings of some of the the desert fathers because i'm so immersed in the spirituality of like we're constantly singing these hymns at vespers and matins that's putting me in the right context to read them and and um yeah and in the same way like i'm not immersed in the spirituality that's putting me in the context that makes sense. for gazing upon the host. Um, so, I feel, I feel nothing. I feel absolutely nothing, nothing wrong. No hesitation yeah. with other people gazing upon the Eucharist. Um, so it's not like I'm sitting there and I'm like, why are they even like looking at it? Just, you know, um, it's just like, um, there's, there's nothing that I don't find that it adds to my experience of the presence of the Lord to look at the host. Let, um, let me see if I can come up with an, an analogy which might help us understand this. It, would it be like a Western Catholic coming to your profession, say, 
and they see people venerating the icons and to them it's like it kind of looks a bit weird like their mm -hmm. skin kind of looks green their eyes and nose look strange i'm really glad people are into it i just this is not how i'm this isn't helping me pray right now yeah is it kind of like that it's like i see the merit in it it's just not part of my yeah absolutely um and and i think that it's a i think that it's a beautiful tradition um, it's just not the tradition that I'm immersed in. Yeah. And so it's, it's, um, might be harder for me to enter into. So I can appreciate that tradition while entering into my own tradition. Yep. Okay. That's good. Uh, Nathan Alex says, hi sister. Can you talk about why monasticism is so heavily emphasized in the East and any advice on single lay people trying to incorporate more monastic habits between singleness and marriage? Mm -hmm. So, um, one uh, one thing I'll say is that, like, as to why it's so emphasized in the East is um, because it, it's held up as the life of perfection. So we're all striving for perfection, for holiness. And so this is the life that we hold up as the ideal of that mm -hmm. um, because it's the life of, like we talked about earlier, it's the life of repentance and um and of striving for that. But it's also called um, the monastic life. Like at the end of the service of a, of a monastic profession, uh, each person goes up to venerate the hand cross of the, the newly professed nun. And they venerate the hand cross and they say, they say, what is your name, mother? And you answer, Mother Natalia. Mm. And they say, may you be saved in the angelic ranks. Um, which one of the, this is actually very, very cool. So one of the, one of the views in um, Eastern Christianity, I think I read this in Mountain of Silence by Kyriakos Markides. Have you yeah, read this book? It's I've read good. some of it. Um, so uh, the pseudo Father Maximus, um, he like that's not his real name is what I mean. He, um, but in the book he's called Father Maximus. Um, he's a real monk. They just use a pseudonym. But he um, he's talking about how um, there's this view in the East that. Um, the, the, the angels who fell from heaven, this is not dogma. This is just one of the theories. The angels who fell from heaven were, um, of one rank of angels. Cause we have different ranks of angels, right? There's mm -hmm. the cherubim, the seraphim, the archangel, so on and so forth. Um, and that the monastics, um, are called to replace that rank of angels. I love that. And it's, it's so beautiful. And, and I don't mean that to be very, very clear. I don't mean that in the sense of when we die, we are angels because that is, as we were talking of earlier, heresy. Um, we don't become pure spirit. You know, we have <laughs> um, body and soul in heaven, just like, but um, yeah. there's actually, there's something um, in, I don't remember what this is, but I remember marking something in the Ladder of Divine Ascent that's about monasticism. Um, I marked it as monasticism for the married life. Um, so I'm going to read it. Monasticism for those who are married. I have no recollection mm. of what it says disclaimer really so how do you know where it is did you um, it? i don't even know I where don't know. it is i just, just have i just have a memory of like i had written in the margin oh, wow. you have monastic. lovely handwriting thank you i had written Chloe, you didn't draw that did you i did <laughs> how is that so neat do you use a ruler <laughs> i didn't for do that you have ocd <laughs> okay personal questions <laughs> um i do i do use i didn't use a ruler for that i just drew it but i do, do use, you know what i'm talking about a little bit. There's a little bit of a But CD. I do use my ruler when That's I underline. That's incredible. Okay. All right. Go so ahead. this is this is from the Ladder of Divine Ascent. And this is one of those ones that um, I would not necessarily just like read no. without guidance from someone because it's very intense. And it again, is. it's like written Especially by... Especially because the first step is abandon the world. And yeah. I'm like, screwed. So um, so no I, I have no recollection others. of what okay. this, the text actually just says. I just wrote in the margin monasticism for those who are married. Some people living carelessly in the world have asked me, we have wives and are beset with social cares, and how can we lead the solitary life? I replied to them, do all the good you can. So this is the response of how do you live monasticism? Do all the good you can. Do not speak evil of anyone. Do not steal from anyone. Do not lie to anyone. Mm. Do not be arrogant towards anyone. Do not hate anyone. Do not be absent from the divine services. Be compassionate to the needy. Do not offend anyone. Do not wreck another man's domestic happiness and be content with what your own wives can give you. If you behave in this way, you will not be far from the kingdom of heaven. 
Um, that, that is beautiful. Right. And this is coming I from... I want to print that and put it on my bedroom This is from in, coming from Climacus, who, yeah. like, as you read this, you just think that he thinks that everyone in the world has to be a monk or they can't go to heaven. Right, um, right. And this is a clear statement of, like, he says, no, like, you do these things and, and like, you're going to be okay. Um, That's but, beautiful. But I would also just repeat what I said earlier of, I would recommend you go on... Um, our monastery's website, ChristTheBridegroom.org, and and look at the link to to our Tipicon, our rule of life, and um and really don't just don't just read it, but pray with it. Like when I when I came on my observership at the monastery and I prayed with with the Tipicon each day, like really brought each section to prayer. My my heart was burning. Like it's a beautiful, beautiful document. Mm. Um and so pray with that and and ask the Lord. Like don't just don't just jump to your own extreme conclusions. Don't just make your own decisions, but really ask the Lord. Um, Lord, in what ways can I apply this to my family? Um, how are you calling me to mm. live a monasticism within my family and to what extent? Because you also have to consider, you have to consider your, your spouse and your kids, you know, yeah. um, like you can't just be imposing things on them that are going to make them miserable. And, and so that's the other thing I would do yeah. is I would, mm. I would encourage you to like, um, maybe start as a family learning more about monasticism and discern together. Like, don't just force these things on your family. To that point, there is a French priest named Jacques Philippe. He mm. wrote a little book called Searching for a Maintaining Peace. Yeah. Familiar? Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. We love him very much in our monastery. One of the things he says that often after our conversion, the problem isn't that we want the wrong thing. At this point, we want the right thing, say the sanctification mm. of our families. He said the problem for us now is we want the right thing in the wrong way. Mm. And I try to remember that as I rally my kids together to pray the rosary. I have a melancholic disposition, and I think by nature tend to be more idealistic and find myself somewhat defeated when I think we're not reaching that ideal as a family. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, this actually caused me quite a lot of frustration because my kids weren't like levitating or kneeling on glass like I demanded they do, broken right. glass. Uh, Why is... Why is the three-year-old not able to just sit in <laughs> silence for 27 yeah, minutes? exactly. So, but what I've found now is if I seriously lower my expectations, we can pray the Holy Rosary every night together. Hmm. You know, like if I'm okay that my daughter's like not even fingering the beads and is just kind of coloring on something or doesn't seem to be paying attention at all. But if I am, and I can do it with great charity and great gentleness and great joy, like mm -hmm. a sort of joy, like kind of even funny. Um, in this funny moments when parents and kids get together to pray for 20 minutes, you know, mm -hmm. then then that's beautiful. That's yeah. so beautiful. That's so beautiful to have a family get together and pray imperfectly, but yeah. to pray. And and I think that there's also something um, very empowering about allowing your spouse, but, but especially your children, to enter into that discernment, like I was saying. You know, like... Um, you know, I mean, guide the discernment as as particularly, you know, the if there's a father figure, like the man as the spiritual head of the household, like guide that discernment for them, um, but allow them to be part of that, you know, like share with them what monasticism is or mm. or like read this paragraph on your own of the Tipicon and and try to like put it into words that your child can understand yeah. and then talk with them about it and be like, um, like, Nate, how do you think that we can apply this as a family like what's one thing that you think that we could do and, and like guide them in that because mm. don't let them pick something extreme right. because then they're going to be discouraged when it fails but, reason, but if they can pick the same something reason simple, i shouldn't choose something that's extreme right because i'll end up discouraged right but if they if they if, if you're able to guide them to like something that's actually doable for yeah. your family then i think that they'll be more able and willing to yeah. do that if if they're the ones who like came up with this idea hmm. you know yeah that's nice yeah that's nice Total side note, I had a priest come up to me last night. I was at a wedding and I went to the reception afterwards and this priest comes up to me and he's like, your son, amazing confession I have with him. I cannot tell you what he said <laughs> because of internal forum. That's my American accent. Um, but yeah, my son, my six-year-old Superman Peter, um, who of course was received chrismation. I've not met Eucharist him, in the Byzantine church. Oh yeah. And he said like, it was outstanding. I'm mm. like, oh my gosh, it's so cool. <laughs> so beautiful. just thought I'd brag on humble my son brag. there. Yeah. Humble brag. Uh, uh, patron. Amazing. I love you. Thank you. Claire Welton says, sister Natalia, as a sister who I assume took a vow of poverty, what have you learned about detachment from earthly things? And what advice do you have for lay people who still have to live in the world? 
yet are also called to detachment? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, Did you take a vow of poverty? We don't technically take vows at all in the East, um, but we... Um, but we do like at the at the life profession, the bishop asks, um, like, are you do, do you promise to live this life of poverty? And and I say, yes, you know, with God's help. And um, so. Um, you know, you know, what's interesting is I don't find I'm, I'm sure this is, is different for, for everybody, but I would say that one of the things that you need to do is really, um, again, bring to prayer because I don't I don't know your interior life. Um, Claire, but 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 bring to prayer the question for the Lord of where do my attachments lie? Because I think that's the first step of of figuring um figuring out how to be detached because mm-hmm. um I don't I don't really struggle with with material attachment. And mm. and that's not because um of any virtue on my part. It's because my attachments lie in other places, yep. you know. Um so most particularly I'm I'm really attached to relationships. Um, and one of the things that I was broken of in, in not broken of totally, um, still being broken of in coming to the monastery was the realization that I'm, I'm attached to my, my time, you know, um, and which is, which is one of the beauties of monasticism is you very quickly realize that your time is not your time. Um, you know, I did, I did a whole episode on our podcast called, um, whose time is it anyway? It's a very clever title. I know Mm -hmm. you can acknowledge the cleverness. Thank you. Um, and the so so I say you very quickly realize as a monastic that your time is not your own, and I say that that's a gift. And the reason it's a gift is because the truth of it is, in the world, your time is also not your own. But it's easier to fool yourself into thinking it is. Yeah. You know, like you can have more control over your time, so you can think that it's your time. Um, but really, all time is 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 God's time that that He gives to us to use in certain ways. And so the gift as a monastic is you figure that out real quick. Um, but, but anyway, so my attachments, relationships, time, um, the monastery is kind of, the monastic life is kind of built to break those attachments. Mm. Um, in the world, you have a little bit more of, um, you have to take the responsibility upon yourself. Just a have little kids. Bit to They'll break damage those. every good thing you've wanted to maintain. <laughs> right. Um, so I would say pay attention um, so again, prayerfully discern that, but also pay attention to, um, which things, uh, upset you, you know, like if you, um, if you're in the middle of something and someone suddenly knocks on the door and you're like pretty angry about it, um, or frustrated or whatever, maybe you're attached to your own time or you're attached to your way, productivity yeah. or you're attached to, so like pay attention to the, that to is the movements. That is really enlightening your... because we often think of what are you attached to is immediately physical objects. Right. Um, and so once you realize the attachment, I would say just just um, pray about again, ask the Lord, don't make these decisions on your own, but but ways um, to really um, tangibly combat those things. Um, and in the sense of if if you do realize you're attached to your own time, really, really try to jump at the opportunities when someone else needs something, you mm-hmm. know, like, if you're at the office and you're working on something and you notice that someone is like flustered by the things they're trying to do, you can, in all your right as an employee, you can just stay focused on your work. But if you know that you're attached to your own time and you're attached to your productivity, maybe stop your work and go offer to, to help this other person or something like that. Yeah, that's so really so cool. try to try to discern the ways to like actively combat those attachments. Yeah, because we can yeah, we can get attached to things we perceive to be good and all things being equal, they are. Like mm-hmm. a good schedule. Like I need a good schedule so I can be more efficient and get mm-hmm. done what I have to get done. Um but yeah, you can be attached to that as well. I had to drop my kids off today at school and I the the gas tank was on empty and I was frustrated about that because I had to go fill it up, which meant I had to spend another 10, 15 minutes in the car. Mm-hmm. Um and I was conscious of that at the time. Like, I'm getting frustrated. Interesting. Yeah. We'll look at that later, Jesus. Derek Cummins. And i got to say, this, this... I know him. Do you? Derek's amazing. I, I bet you do know him. Here's why. Here's what's cool about Derek. He probably doesn't mind that I'm going to share this story. But if he does, sorry. How do I know Derek him? was a Protestant youth pastor okay. who left P- Protestantism because he he believed it to be false or at least not entirely true this is who you were talking to me about earlier i don't know but okay. he's now 
has been discerning between Eastern Catholicism and Orthodoxy. Okay. And I believe he's in an Orthodox church. Beautiful guy. Beautiful guy. I would never say that to his face. Um, or, you know. I think you just did. Ah. He says this, have you had many experiences with Eastern Orthodoxy, such as clergy, laity, monastics, that have been positive? <laughs> that's ex that's interesting. Or maybe because he's saying because you're an Eastern Catholic. Yes. So, okay. Uh, as one who is living in the Eastern Christian tradition, yes. have they accepted you as one of them? What's that What's that been like for you, first of all? Um, so I'm going to, I'll answer the question of have I had many that have been positive? And, and the answer is yes. Um, and... So you don't hang out with a lot of YouTube Orthodox people? I mean, I didn't say that I've not had many that have been negative. Ah. Um, but I have had many also that have been positive. Yeah. Um, one example of this, just from yesterday, um, we got an, an RSVP from, um, we have five Coptic Orthodox nuns coming to the life profession. Um, there's this this um, community of, of Coptic Orthodox nuns that, um, that we've spent some time with. Um, on a few occasions, and they're just so beautiful. And uh, actually, their their priest and his wife are probably also um, coming to the profession. So mm. seven Coptic Orthodox. Um, there are there's um, one of, one of my most beautiful experiences of this was um, Mother and I, Mother Theodore and I went to uh, to another state for their the I think fiftieth anniversary of their parish and the celebration, a Byzantine Catholic parish. And there at the reception, um, we meet these two Orthodox priests who have formed this really good relationship with the Byzantine parish. And so they're there and um, they, you know, they're talking with mother and I and they're like, please come come to our come to our liturgy tomorrow. This this reception was on a Saturday night. Um, they had had liturgy at the Byzantine parish before the reception. And um, so that was the, the Sunday obligation for us because to go to an Orthodox liturgy would not fulfill our Sunday, Sunday obligation. So we're like, we've already been to liturgy. Like we can go to the Orthodox mm -hmm. church tomorrow. So we go to their parish and these, and, and the parish is so welcoming. And this is one of the most beautiful things we, um, typically there are exceptions to this, but typically as a Catholic Roman or Byzantine, you aren't able to receive communion in an Orthodox parish. Um, again, there are exceptions, but, but typically, so mother and I, um, are in the front pew at this parish and the, um, if you've never been to a Byzantine liturgy, what happens with the, the communion bread, it's leavened bread, um, that's consecrated into the body of Christ. And then it's placed inside the chalice with the blood, but, but it's the center part of the loaf that becomes the body of Christ. So the edges of the loaf are first cut off. And so they're blessed, but they don't become the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And then usually it's called the antiteron, at least in the, the Slavic word. And then so after liturgy, those those pieces of the edges, the blessed bread, are distributed. And anyone, Catholic or otherwise, or Orthodox or otherwise, or whatever, can receive them because they're just blessed. They're not the body of Christ. Um, so we're at this liturgy. Before communion, the, the priest... Um, motions to one of the altar servers up in the sanctuary and the altar server comes over the priest whispers to him the altar server goes he gets this antiteron in the middle of the liturgy before communion um, and then a little um, a little glass with uh, wine not the blood of mm -hmm. Christ just wine and the server brings it out to the front pew up to mother and I and and allows us to have this antiteron this blessed this blessed bread and blessed wine not the body and blood of Christ um, so that we can receive this in some sort of communion mm, with all those beautiful. who are about yeah. to receive the body and blood of Christ. So he went as um, far as he thought he could mm -hmm. to extend. And then, and then welcome. both of, and then the that priest, um, he's come to visit the monastery. Both priests actually have come to visit the monastery and and things like that. And so, so I've I've definitely had positive experiences. Um, so yeah. yeah, and I I really believe that that reunification of East and West. I really believe it's going to be through through grassroots movements like that yeah. you know it's going to be like those kinds of relationships are what really um build the reunification i, I spoke to the fathers at uh, holy resurrection and he said something that stuck with me he said we see ourselves as you know what part of the body of christ are we as scabs on the body of christ mm. and what he meant by that because that sounds kind of gross is um sign for deeper healing that mm. needs to take place between east and west which i thought was really a cool 
beautiful way of putting yeah, it. Yeah, I like that a lot. One of, one of the other nuns describes it, and I, I think this is also a very beautiful analogy, as it, it feels like as Byzantine Catholics, we can sometimes feel like the children of divorced parents. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have... Uh, we An have allegiance the, to both, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, to yeah, Rome and, and to the traditions of the East. Exactly. But the, one of the times that I, I really felt this, uh, this, this chasm the most acutely, and it was the most painfully, was when we were in the Holy Land... Um, we did the we went we went to the Holy Sepulcher for for an all night vigil and so if you if you're if you're in the Holy Land you can go to the Holy Sepulcher you can sign up they have um I think f maybe fifteen slots per group of people or something like that and it's so like fifteen slots for the Catholics fifteen for the Orthodox fifteen for the Armenians and maybe that's it and um I'm just looking over to Mother Gabriella for confirmation and so. But, but if you go, you have to stay in all night because they don't open the doors um, unless there happens to be a liturgy in the middle of the night. And then they um, they don't um, – you're not allowed to sleep while you're in there. And so if you fall asleep while you're in there, they'll, they'll like, come and wake you up. And so so some of us, uh, some of us nuns signed up for this as well as a couple people from the group, pilgrimage group that we were with. And we signed up, obviously, for the Catholic section. So the time comes – um, at the beginning of the night where those who are staying for the vigil um, are like put into the groups at the entrance of the sepulcher. And so they have the Catholics, the Orthodox, and the Armenians. Um, and there was like argument, like they were like, because we look Orthodox, <laughs> but we are Catholic. Um, and then and then we really, really felt this because when um, that morning there was a Catholic mass inside the tomb. And so, um, you know, I'm talking with one of the monks to ask him, like, can we go to this mass? And he says, no, it's only for the Catholics. And, and I said, we, we are Catholic. And he said, to go to the mass, you have to be Catholic. And I said, we, we are, are Catholic. Catholic. And I said, we're Byzantine Catholic. And he was like, and he looks at me and he says, you can ask the priest. And I was like, great. Who's the priest? And he was like, he only speaks Italian and Spanish. And Did he's he like, say oh, it while smiling? Oh, smug, yeah. What a jerk, um, God forgive and me. And I'm like, well, I speak enough Spanish that I can ask him. And so, like, I go talk to the priest and I explain that we're um, mm -hmm. um, Byzantinos <laughs> and um, Byzantinas because we're monjas. Um, and, uh, and he's like, absolutely, you can come mm. to Mass. And so we're able to... That's a cool story come, because so. you often hear from Byzantine Catholics about sort of prejudice from Orthodox. Mm -hmm. You don't often hear about it the other way around. So that's an interesting example. So, yeah. Uh, a quick question. Why aren't you, why are you Catholic? Why aren't you Orthodox? Now we can, I want to get to like asking, do you consider yourself? And that's, that's the second part of this question. Do you consider yourself Orthodox in union with Rome? But I want to ask you just kind of directly, why aren't you Orthodox? Why are you Catholic? Other than just sort of circumstantial. In other words, like I ran into the monastery, they seem really right, cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, very, very simply, it's, um, to, to remain in communion with Rome, to, to cool. remain under the Pope. That's the simplest answer of it. Okay. And then his question is, do you consider yourself Orthodox in union with Rome or Catholic who prefers the Eastern expressions? That's a good question. Um, you know, I don't really, I don't want to label it in any way because there are that's so cool. many prejudices that, that cool go answer. with the labels. Yep. Um, so I'll just say that I, I, yeah. Yeah. Maddie Herbert. I think I know Maddie. Maddie Hebert. Yeah. Hebert. You I know love it. her. She's in Steubenville now. Yes. She's lovely. Love you, I've met her a couple of times uh, yeah. while here. She I says, knew her. I um, met her out in LA a couple of times. She says, hello, sister Natalia. If you could give one piece of practical advice for women to their vocation, what would it be? Praying for you and your soon to occur life profession. Mm -hmm. Now you've spoken Maddie's about this. Maddie's going to be there too. Oh, terrific. Yeah. You've spoken about this earlier in the show, but maybe you want to say something else. Practical advice for women discerning their vocation, and would you be offended if I poured myself some whiskey? No, okay, not at all. Okay, go. Um, my, my practical advice would be, um, yeah, I think it would be the thing that I, I talked about before of don't be afraid to take steps because mm -hmm. no step is, is a total commitment um, and it's not wasted time. But, but the other thing I would say is... Um, is be in contact with communities. That was that was mm -hmm. really really important to me. I the the first time that I wanted to discern um, discern religious life, 
I um I went on a self-imposed dating fast, right? And mm-hmm. I'm I'm sure I talked about this a little bit last time, but I um I wasn't like praying about my vocation. I wasn't um visiting any communities. I wasn't talking to any any communities. I was simply not dating. So I was like not doing this really fun thing that I love to do, and I'm like filling that space with nothing. Mm-hmm. Not with Jesus, not with nuns, not with anything, right? <laughs> and um and um that very quickly failed uh because i met a guy and i was like i like men i'm clearly not called to be a nun uh and so i just like ended the dating fast early Mm. and so so the second time i decided to discern um you know i was like i'm not gonna date until i actually visit a community and um and part of that's like i'm just a very experiential person and Mm. so I, i really need to experience things so so i would encourage you to actually be in touch with a community and go visit them um, that's good yeah and if, don't keep it yeah, theoretical exactly yeah. yeah it's almost like the equivalent of just take her out on a date mm-hmm. you're not committing mm-hmm. that kind of thing yeah here, here's a good question it, it's it's about a well it's about two three sentences so bear with me here it comes from becca davis thanks for being a patron becca it's a great question she says i've heard father mike schmidt say that an important component of discerning your vocation is what you want i deeply want to be married and raise a family, but I don't know if that is a vestige of my Protestant upbringing or not. You've often spoken about your desire for a family in previous interviews. So how did you determine that what you wanted and what God wanted were not aligned? Hmm. What would you say to someone trying to discern between the two? Excellent question. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I, I would say, I would say, first of all, can you read that first sentence again, the one that has Father Mike Schmitz in it? Uh, yeah, she, she heard Father Mike Schmitz, at least she thinks it was Father Mike Schmitz, mm-hmm. say that an important component of discerning your vocation is what you want. Got it. So um, I think something to notice there is that uh, he says that it's an important component. It's not the only component. And so I think that's, that's really significant mm. um, because God uses everything within us to direct us towards him, mm-hmm. right? Like, he gave us desires and um we ourselves or the devil can pervert those desires or can misdirect those desires but but we have good desires within us from the lord and so that's why they can guide us in our discernment um but i would say um the the correction the correction that i would give to becca it was becca um yes um the the correction i would give is that i wouldn't say that what i wanted was misaligned with what god wanted Mm. what i would say is i didn't fully realize what i wanted Mm. um and and also that i i could choose to leave the monastery and to be married and still go to heaven yes that was a really really important um realization for me on my pre tantra retreat before I got the habit in my new name, I had to realize that even though I fully believed God was calling me to this, I could say no and he would still love me and and I could still be holy. <laughs> um, but it wouldn't make my life easier. <laughs> and there would be other times that I would be asked to say yes in different ways. Yeah. And so, um, but but I want to go back to that statement that I said of, of I didn't fully realize what I wanted because I think that... Um, when our desires or what we want are indicative in our discernment part of that is i think we need to to really prayerfully look at with a spiritual director um particularly if you're discerning vocation you need a spiritual director um with our spiritual director and in prayer we need to look at the roots of those desires like what is it that i desire in marriage because maybe it's not marriage itself maybe it's these other things in marriage that God wants to fulfill through the monastic life, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So I think, I think that's part of it as well Um, is um, I I realize, and I've said this before, but I think that one of the things that I've come back to again and again and again is a homily that Father Michael gave um, long before I entered the monastery, but he said he believes Mm. that we all have a natural call to marriage but that some have a supernatural call to celibacy. So it's not, it's not that the way, the way I speak of it usually is that a, a call to celibacy, it's not, it's not like, I'm not gonna be able to articulate this well, but it's not like it replaces the call to marriage, 
it's that it um, transcends it. Mm. It transcends the call to marriage. And so um, so it's like the, the ache that's there <laughs> for marriage can make my monasticism more fruitful, you know? Um, and Gosh, that's lovely. Yeah. And so, so, so the last thing I would say, um, although if you think I haven't fully answered it, Matt, please say so. But the last thing I would say is that when you're looking at what you want... As you're in prayer and as you're having different experiences, like either if you're if you're dating and discerning marriage with someone or you're at a you're at a monastery and you're discerning monasticism, like as you're having these different experiences or as you're praying about these different things, um, pay attention to. For, for me, the big the, the key indicators were joy and peace, because these are fruits of the Holy Spirit and the, the joy and the peace mm. can be really indicative of those deeper desires, the ones that we're not necessarily seeing for ourselves, because as humans, we're just incredibly skilled at self-deception. Um, yeah. And, and, and the, 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 the recognition of the joy and the peace, those need to come through building, um, through building a prayer life, through really working on the relationship with God, because joy and peace are not the same as happiness and, um, and like, lack of external um external troubles or something like mm -hmm. that you know it's a deeper thing than that yes. so um and, yeah. and this might sound a little um surfacey but it might be important to kind of circle this wagon again mm -hmm. uh the way <laughs> it's not as if the way you know you're called to be a nun is if you have no desire for a sexual relationship or children truth and we talked about that last mm -hmm. time and I, and I don't know if you want to kind of put point that out again because I mean, the, I mean, I'll just say yes. Yeah, that's true. Right. In fact, if you had no desire for those things, that might be a serious red flag, correct? I mean, you said earlier that you were afraid to get married because you thought it could only be miserable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I mean, and that's part of, um, you know, we have we have I would say most, if not all religious communities now, including our monastery, um, have discerners do a psychological evaluation before they enter. And, and part of that is to look for the things like, is this person going to try to kill me in my sleep? Uh, but part of it is also to to just be like, is this person discerning monasticism because um, they had this like horrible relationship with their dad and so yeah. they're afraid of men or something? Yeah. You know, it's like there there is some of that because because it's not for your good or for our good if you're if you're entering into celibacy for for the wrong reasons or for running right. away again um, but but, but yeah. nor nor is the requirement to join the monastery a lack of serious well a lack of woundedness right as yeah, if yeah, to yeah. say yeah. only if you've had a good relationship with your father and have a perfect view yeah, of marriage absolutely. yeah absolutely yeah to go back to like monasticism is meant to be a life of healing mm. and a life of recovery and all of that like we're all very very wounded um but but yeah it's that my my desire my desire for a husband really helps me I've, I've seen the ways in which it has made my spousal relationship with christ so much more fruitful mm. and and my desire for children i have a deep desire for children and and that's made it um so much easier for me to open myself to motherhood to all of the people that that the lord puts in my life you know and it gives me this great freedom to love so many more as my children yeah. well, than I would have been able to do. One thing I love is when I get the occasional text from you out of the blue saying, the Lord just placed you and your family on my heart and I want mm. you to know I'm playing, praying for you. That's, yeah. that is, I just feel so <laughs> loved by that. Thank you. I can't wait to call you mother. Um, Katerina Eramondi says, what sorts of insights can you give about relating to Christ as your bridegroom husband? How has belonging to Christ the Bridegroom Monastery affected the way you relate to the Lord in your daily life and prayer? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question as well. Um, one thing I would say, if 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 you if you've reached a certain level of maturity in your prayer, and I think you would realize this quickly if you if you tried it and it didn't go so well, um, is I would recommend praying with the Song of Songs. Mm. Um, so. Uh, reading that book that that book that I mentioned earlier, Cantata of Love, um, and I'm gonna follow up and make sure you read it. Yeah, please Matt. do that. I'm gonna buy it. I will immediately. Okay. Like right um, now. Okay. Can you buy it? <laughs> yeah, Neil, no. can you get on that? <laughs> um, so seriously, the <laughs> um, the 
the um, but we at our monastery um, after Compline. This is only something our monastery does. It's not at the. Um, it's not part of the the service. But after Compline each night we pray. Um, we chant antiphonally a chapter of the Song of Songs. Mm. Um, yeah. And so that's something that's really helped me to, to enter into this, this spousal relationship with the Lord. But part of it also has been, um, you know, and, and Christopher, who, you know, commented the hi to us earlier today, um, he talks a lot about this, uh, this receptivity that we need to have with the Lord of, of opening ourselves to him. And that's a way in which we're, we're all called to be, to see Christ as bridegroom. So like, that's something I'll say is that we're all called to see Christ as bridegroom, yeah. men and women. And, and this isn't some, you know, this isn't, you know, we had someone like, we had someone comment on uh like our Facebook page or something like that one time that was like, these people are clearly not Orthodox, which we're not, but like they're, they, this is not something against the Orthodox. This is something against this person who had a very, like a misconception of Orthodoxy because she's like, they're clearly not Orthodox because they keep talking about Christ as their bridegroom. And that's very, this like new Roman thing. Mm. And, what, and I'm like, we have ancient Eastern services about Christ the bridegroom. Like we have during Holy Week, we have a morning prayer, um, Byz like Byzantine Catholic and Orthodox. So again, this woman just didn't understand Orthodoxy. But um during during holy week um the first few mornings we have a service called bridegroom matins in which we have the bridegroom tropar which we sing at our monastery every night um at compline and because it's like our patronal our patronal hymn but uh but yeah it's like there there's so much there's so much out there so much writing uh on christ the bridegroom um by East and West. And another great book is um, Wounded by Love by Porphyrius, um, Elder Porphyrius. And it's it's incredible. Um, I first encountered it from that Orthodox priest who I met at that uh, anniversary reception. But um, Wounded by Love is a really good book to read that, that helps you. Um, mm. And again, it's written by it's written by a monk and it really helps you to, to kind of to just fall in love with with Jesus. So that's beautiful. I've never, ever had the problem of seeing Christ as my bridegroom. Mm. It's been a grace. I know many men who have. No, it's been yeah. a grace for me. It's the Song of Songs is, is the book I'd like read to me as I'm dying. It is what speaks to me more than anything else. In fact, I'll sometimes swap out the words of the Jesus prayer with, I am my beloved and he is, I am my beloved's mm. and he is mine. We have um, at our monastery, that's, that's in our Tipicon, is that as, um, as a nun in our monastery is dying, um, the other nuns keep vigil at her mm. deathbed until she dies, chanting um, the Song of Songs and the Psalms. Well, Sorry, right? the Song of Songs and the Psalms, yeah. You know, he, just to bring this back to Aquinas again, he um, is said to have, he died at a Cistercian monastery on his way to a particular church council. And while he was dying, the Cistercians asked him to narrate a commentary on the Song of Songs. Mm. Um, you may close that door. If you want. Is it too hot? I open that because it might be a bit hot. You can, you can throw it shut. Go right. on, do it. Now, we don't know if that's apocryphal or not, but we, we don't have the text. But it is interesting. I believe it was St. John of the Cross who asked that the Song of Songs be read as he was dying. And mm. It is just glorious. I'm just going to scandalize people and push my sleeves up a little bit because it was kind of hot. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, beautiful stuff. This is, this is lovely. But what else have we got here? Gary Myers, who's a patron. That's the Australian newscaster voice. Welcome back to the nightly news. Crazy COVID laws in Australia. Gary Myers says, Sister Natalia, I have a friend who is a deacon in the Episcopal Church and has an issue with the perceived lack of women in leadership within the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Can you explain your view on the role of women in leadership within the church? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I think that um, I, I won't even speak to it very much. What I'll do is point you to someone who I think speaks very beautifully of it, which is St. John Paul II. So, uh, you know, I, I had someone, I had someone reach out, um, I had someone reach out through, through my podcast who was, um, upset about something that I had said, um, about not being supportive of women priests. And, um, and, you know, I think that part of, part of the sadness in our society is that we don't recognize the difference between the roles of men and women. Um, and like like we call St. Mary Magdalene 
the equal to the apostles, mm. right? But we don't call her an apostle, like, but she was an equal. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's, yeah, it's, go, it's go. not like she's a lesser, mm -hmm. um, but she has a different role. Mm. And um, and and I think that part of the part of the problem with with um, when women are trying to take up the role of men. In doing so, they're neglecting some of the roles that they could be taking up as women. Um, so I, I think that the the roles of leadership for women within the church lie in different areas. Um, and I'll say that one of the things that I think our church is greatly lacking right now is the role of spiritual mothers. And um, and this is something spiritual motherhood is something that all that all women are called to, not not just nuns who are life professed and are called mother. Um, and so I think that there are ways within parishes that women can step up to be to be spiritual mothers and to really um, like reach into the places of their of their femininity um, that allow them to like reach certain groups within the parish um, that are not the same as as being deacons or priests or something like that, um, and the yeah, I just like there there are very particular reasons that priests need to be men, um, and again Saint John Paul II speaks to this very well. So he has a document on the the reason I point to him in particular is because JP2 has this document um, that I, I brought to a priest who um, he was he was preaching in his homily. Um, you know, I'll just I'll just tell the story about the um, this is the one that upset someone who wrote into the podcast. But I was at a, I was at a mass one time and um, the priest in his homily seemed to me to be advocating for women priests. And um, I was really upset by this because I was thinking of um, I was thinking of my mom because my mom has this just really, really beautiful childlike faith. Like she has a kind of faith that I aspire to. Um, and because of this, she will take what a priest or a nun says as gospel truth, you know, because she should be able to, <laughs> like, mm, you know, that yeah. should be the case. And so I'm, I'm thinking of her as, as he's preaching this homily. And I'm thinking if there's someone in this congregation like my mom, they're going to think this is now what the church teaches. Yes. And so, um, so I was very upset and, um, and I, I leave the church. I mean, I, I stayed for, for the rest of mass, but I, I leave the church afterwards and I'm like, I'm going to write to the bishop because that's not okay. And then I was like, no, don't write to the bishop. Go talk to the priest because if you have a problem with your brother, go to your brother. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so I schedule an appointment with this priest and, and I approach him like, with in a rare in a moment of grace because i am not a meek person at all i approach him with meekness and gentleness and i said um you know i received what you said in your homily as this and i might have been misinterpreting and so on and so forth and he's like you didn't misinterpret that's exactly what i was saying and i was like okay well um like you can't say that and he's like I'm a priest. This I'm entitled to my want. own opinion. This is where I want non-meek Sister Natalia to come out and be like, <laughs> shame on you. And throw a glass of water in his face. Um, yeah, I didn't do that. But <sighs> um, but he's, I, um, he says like, well, I'm, my, I'm a priest, but I'm still entitled to my own opinion. And I was like, that's true. But if that opinion is in contradiction to church teaching, you can't preach it from the pulpit. Like you promised obedience. Um, and he was like, well, I believe Rome is in flux about this. This was when Pope Francis was, was first pope. Um, and I was like, well... Um, Rome's not in flux about this. Like JP2 wrote this this document that's only like two pages about mm -hmm. ordination of women. And the whole document basically just says never. Yeah. And um, I said, but even if Rome is in flux, um, as of right now, this is the church teaching and um, like you're in obedience to that. And he's like, okay, well, agree to disagree. And I was like, okay. You're like, so, no, shut so the door. Then you I sit left. down. <laughs> so then Sorry. I left. And, I just, um, and I'm going to be daydreaming about this. Um, go. So then I left and then I wrote the bishop. Because um, I was like, yeah, my, my brother that's where didn't. You go. Right. Yeah. So, um, but. Did you get a response? Um, oh, yes. Oh. Yes. He responded and he was like, he him. responded very quickly and he was Good like, this him. won't happen again. Um, and I won't say what diocese it was, yeah. obviously. But. Um, but anyways, so so the reason I like to use St. John Paul II for this is because he wrote this document. And at the same time, like St. John Paul II wrote The Dignity of Women. Mm. And he like 
more than I'm not going to say more than any other pope because I don't know lots of the sure. popes, but more than any of the other popes that I know, he like extensively promoted um, the role of women in the church and the dignity of women. So I would I would recommend read this church this this document that he wrote about um, ordination of women and read what he wrote on the dignity of women, um, and and you'll just see like. Um, the difference of the the roles of women and men in the priest in the, that uh, in is, the church. That's beautiful. Good for you for having the courage to do that. That that actually does that takes courage to approach a priest and do that as you did, and not just write to the bishop. I would also recommend that people check out a talk by Peter Kreeft called "Why Only the Boys Can Be Their Daddies." <laughs> I believe that's what it's called. It's an excellent talk. That's great uh, on on male ordination. All right, sister, soon to be mother. I think we're pretty much. Wrapping up here. Great. Anything else you want to touch upon? Point people to? Tell um, them where to buy chotkeys from? <laughs> Who's that chotkey for? Oh, you can't tell me. Yeah, no. we're not talking about that. Right. Um, I do want to let people know that right after this interview ends, Mother Gabriella and Sister Natalia are, we are going to do a private video just for my patrons. So if you are a patron, uh, please be sure to check that out. I think it would be really cool if you would just ask Mother Gabriella about her own discernment and how she became a nun. I would be really interested in that if you're open to chatting about that. So if you are a patron or sure. if you want to become a patron, be sure to check that out. We'll make sure we upload that today. I know the story so I can ask all the leading questions. Ah, I can't wait to hear it. Yeah. Any Anything else you want to um, address? I, I mean, I don't think so. This is your thing. Any well, like, what do you what do you have to do to get prepared for a uh, final final profession? Lifelong. Like, I'm sorry, I keep saying final life lifelong profession. profession. Yeah. Um. So we go on a pre-profession retreat. Cool. Uh, Have you done that yet? I, I did, yeah. I went out to... <laughs> um, it was everything you would expect a pre-profession retreat to be. I have no expectations. Um, <laughs> in the sense of like lots of things went horribly wrong. Oh. <laughs> um, so it started out... My first morning there is um, a story that I promised to tell you later mm. um, yes. in which uh, one of the most embarrassing things of my life happened. Um, and then... Uh, I started also having this um, mysterious case of what I later realized were hives, um, which lasted for four weeks and we're still fighting that. Mm. Um, and they only come at night and they cover like 70 to 80% of my body. And it's How random. Horrible. Is that what hives do? Um, here's the cool thing. Uh, we just, I had a doctor appointment last week and um, and they realized what it is, though we still don't know the cause. It's um, It's autoimmune. And the way that they realized this, so it's not like an allergic reaction, um, but the way that they realized this is um, they drew my, you know how they do like scratch test for allergies? Yeah. So they drew my blood, put it through a centrifuge to pull a serum out, and then um, did a scratch test on me with the serum, and I reacted to my own blood. Wow. Yeah. I'm like, that's straight out. That's not cool. I know. If you're yeah. reacting negatively to your own blood. I know, I'm like allergic blood. to my own blood. It's horrible. Anyway, so that started. That started. I think my, my wife, among retreat. other things, has autoimmune as well. Um, and then I also um, got like a running injury and, and came home on crutches. And so... Old hairy legs is up to his old tricks. Exactly. Trying to take you out before <laughs> lifelong profession. Lifelong. Uh, yeah. Um, I can't wait to learn what that was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, You're not old hairy later. legs, just in case. That was <laughs> Satan. Old hairy legs. Satan. Um, yeah. Um, so anyways, it was, it was really beautiful. I, um, I, I spent the whole retreat, um, praying with, uh, with the, the life profession service and, beautiful. um, just like very intentionally praying with each piece of it. And it was, it was mm. amazing. So, so yeah, there's, there's that. And then, um, yeah. And then, uh, like extra retreat days each month and things like that. So, yeah. I am glad you exist. You are a blessing to me and my family. And Thank I cannot you. wait to call you and treat you as my mother. That's very beautiful. Yes. All right. Thanks. Cheers, Neil. Cheers, mother. We're about to do a video for the patrons. Stick around. Mm -hmm. Thanks.